Serve one for your excellent uh, uh, presenting as well. Thank you to Nick Dubois, he's here between one and four. Thank you to Chris Jacobs, the producer, Isla Theobald and Ava Carroll, who've been the assistant producers. Uh, Dave Rhodes, Tech Up Dave, has been the technical operator. Damien Smith, the visual producer. Parak Thomas, the video editor. And Phil Dave has been the weekend editor. I am back tomorrow between 10 and 1. Plenty to discuss then. Uh, Caitlin Barnsley sent me a very nice uh, text as well. I'm not going to read it out, but she said uh, she talked about how difficult it is to present a three hour programme and know everything that everybody talks to you about, which can be a bit of an issue but I'll be back tomorrow as I say between 10 and 1. Nick Dubois is next. Uh, join him for the next three hours. See you tomorrow. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism in it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, yeah, we're supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
ghost of Margaret Thatcher. She said, you've got to watch. That was the woke that was 10 o'clock Saturday night with Lizzie Cundy, Henry Bolton, Pete Barnes, and of course, the woke woman! Thanks to Peter Cardwell, as ever, a brilliant three hours with him. I hope I can match his standard and you can help me do that because what you want to talk about is what I would like to talk about. 0344 499 So, let me ask you this. How might a change in leadership help the Tories? Now, we've talked about this before, of course, but today speculation is rife uh, that the right wing of the parliamentary party are prepared to back Penny Morden for the leadership and the suggestion is that is leadership before a general election. Yes, another change. Would it change the fortunes of the Conservative Party and how? 0344 499 1000. Look, I woke up this morning, saw this story and the first great thought I had was how can I summarise this? Well, I'm asking you a penny for your thoughts. OK, all right, it's best I can do at this time. Uh, meanwhile, MPs still remain in the news. Uh, taxpayers may very well be shocked to see politicians receiving an above inflation pay rise. And that puts them on roughly about £91,000 a year. As, uh, and I'll check that later, but I'm pretty sure it's around there. Now, this, of course, comes at a time when you and many others are struggling to make those household budgets stack up. But I'm going to put it to you that MPs' pay has actually always been far lower than the roles uh, other MPs carry out in Western Europe. And frankly, we're playing catch-up. I think 91000 is actually a reasonable salary for an MP. Ah, I hear you throwing things at the screen or perhaps whatever device you're listening through. But I will go on to explain. But you must be part of the conversation. Convince me I'm wrong. 0344 499 1000. Uh, and, of course, social care is in meltdown. Uh, you know, I've been talking about this for a long time. It's a subject that I want to talk about again because, and this is the only thing I disagree with, a shock report... Well, it's no shock, actually. This has been an issue that has refused to be dealt with by most main parties for far too long. Oh, and the Liberal Democrats when they were in coalition government. But it warns that the crippled system of social care is now busier than ever. Now, it is absolutely true. And why am I bringing it up again? It's because I actually would like to hear your experiences. This is one of those issues that not many people really pay attention to unless it affects them. Well, I can tell you it's affected us. I'm absolutely appalled at how bad it is, but do you know what really gets me going more? Neither of the main parties, Labour or Conservative, have sought to address this in any significant detail. They are pushing it into the long grass again. Tell me your experiences with social care. Has it failed you? 0344 499 1000. And a police hotline Sounds a good idea, doesn't it? You want to improve the standards of the police. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner says there's lots of people we've got to weed out. But actually, is it also open to abuse? And will it mean that a simple phone call puts more police officers onto suspension, uh, possibly restricted duties? And we actually find it's months, sometimes years, before an issue is resolved. Is this just a gimmick? to make things look like they're being done. All that and more, including my first guest, who's with me now in the studio to review the top stories of the day and share opinions. Dr Parth Patel, senior research fellow, who leads work, and this is going to be interesting in the light of our conversation, on democracy and political reform at the Institute for Public Policy Research. Welcome. Hi, Nick. So Good to be here. Tell us, just to put it uh, clearly for everyone else, the IPPR, as I'll keep referring to it, the Institute for Public Policy Research, what do they do? We're a progressive think tank. So we look to advance questions of justice within this country, whether that's social justice, economic fairness, environmental justice, democratic justice. And, and is it fair to say it's centre-left? Yes. OK, in, t in terms of, of policy. How long has it been going? Uh, oh, that's an excellent question for someone who worked for the IPPR. I think it's since 88, late okay. 80s. All right, so it rose in the middle of the Thatcher era, effectively, or actually towards the end of the Thatcher yeah, era. Yeah, it was the engine behind some of the thinking around New Labour. 
okay. and was um, was was at least uh, the source of a lot of the policy ideas during the Blair years. Well, it'd be very interesting if you uh, if we're having a discussion that you then want to pick up path on or have a challenge or just raise with me, you can do that. Oh three four 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 double nine one thousand. Remember, my question is: How might a change in leadership help the Tories? A penny for your thoughts. So, listen, let me ask you that question. How am I such a... I, I know, I've got to stop laughing because I can't quite... How many Prime Ministers have we been through since the 19 election? We had Boris Johnson, uh, then we had Liz Truss, and then we had Rishi Sunak. So it would be the fourth in four year, four 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 and a half years if they yeah. did change. Yeah, that's completely shambolic. Would it help? Well, Seriously, <laughs> be objective for a second. Could you see? Things have got bad for Sunak, haven't they? He's, he's, nothing's moved the opinion polls, have they? No, and like the, the question is more about how much of that is to do with Sunak and how much of that is to do with the party, right? What we're seeing right now is, I mean, t to put it simply, Nick, is a Conservative Party in total disarray. Um, well, I think you're being kind. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's so weak that the, the various factions come in and out every week trying to sort of brief against one another. That is not a good place for the mainstream right-wing party of one of the oldest democracies in the world. That is quite a dangerous place, I would argue. And I have no idea well, how Well, maybe it plays existential out. for them. Yeah. I'm not sure it's dangerous for the country anymore because we're coming up so close to an election. So I, I would argue it's more an existential threat for the Conservatives. But let me just pin you down. I, I, mm. if, do you... Would you sit there and think, if there's a leadership election, this is just making it worse, or actually it could make it better for them if someone like Penny Morden was to be anointed, because there wouldn't be a member's vote. You wouldn't have time. <laughs> yeah, to, to be honest, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Okay. As you say, we're having an election in less than a year. We've constantly got about when that is. By the time you've gotten through the process of replacing Rishi Sunak with a different Conservative MP, it's the, the logic so it's more is, like it's even in an age of presidential prime ministers. It's more like moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic. It is, bit. to be frank, inward looking. Okay, right? Is right. that the party is so out of touch with <laughs> where the country is at? We've got major. I am going to challenges. take you up on that. I'm not going to let you just get away with everything. Yeah, well, but, but l l listen to me, Nick. Well, uh, uh, before I listen to you, okay. we've got someone who's just called in sure. who, who's going to answer fine. this question as well, mm. and then I promise I'll come back yeah, to yeah. you. You're, you're here as our guest, David in Glasgow. You'd like to talk about Penny Morden. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all well. Lovely to hear from you. Thank you for calling good. and kicking us off. Good. Uh, an effective leader, i.e. Paddy Morgan, would only be as good as an effective policy. Right. Uh, you know, I think Penny Morgan as, as an individual, I think, would be a bit more down to earth, a bit more efficient in the delivery, a bit more realistic, but it uh, has to be tied in with effective policies. And what would you think, give me your number one or two effective policies, what would you see that, that those areas being in? Prime example is, I, I couldn't believe it when I, when I seen it, when I heard it in the news of electric ambulances. Oh yes. You know, yes. That's, that's no solution at, at all. We have to in this country be brave and bold, I think we have to grab the, the hydrogen solution and, and drive that forward. Imagine that, imagine that the world that we could live in if hospitals were, were powered by hydrogen and the hydrogen powered the ambulances. Now, Penny Morgan, could she deliver that? If Morgan, she did, should we, yes. get, should we get my vote? OK, um, second issue? What, what else uh, troubles you? When you go in that voting box, what will you be thinking of? I think the second issue is really down to, to, to the, the, the economy. You know, we have to look at... You know, we've been through a couple of years where it's been very difficult for economy-wise, so policies have to be driven towards those on the lower end of, of the, the, the income spectrum. Why don't we in this country have a radical look at income tax uh, and the council tax and try and come up with a system that's m more fair? Ra more raising fair. income tax thresholds maybe to £20,000? Take a lot of people out on the lower end of the scale who are working? Why don't we introduce what they've done in Scotland as a, as a, as a bottom tier income tax bracket? We, we you pay, what is it, 19%? That's right. You know? OK, uh, hang on there, option. David. Let's bring Path in. Um, actually, interesting. It's sort of saying, yes, leadership change, not a bad idea, but it's got to come with policies. That's 
pretty much where you've been, isn't it? You, you I, I, I certainly agree with the caller from Glasgow that policy change and policy solutions. David's still on the line. Yeah. Perfect. Hi, yeah. David. Um, I completely oh, yeah. agree with you that we need policy solutions commensurate to the challenges of, of our society today, right? Life expectancy and living standards are falling after flatlining for about 15 years. We don't even know if there's going to be a copper or a doctor there in our hour of need. That is a disastrous place for us to be in. The problem is we've got a governing party that is fighting itself. It is looking at its, it inwards at its own MPs and the different power battles happening within it, that it's unable to even think about these issues. It doesn't have the bandwidth to even consider the scale of the problems you're describing. It's not thinking adequately about the economy, and it's sort of there's Michael Gove releasing his new extremism definition. Look, fine, I understand that's, you, that's the thing that really animates you, but it's not the thing that's animating most people in the country today. Um, and so in that sense, I really agree that we need a, new, a, new, a policy change. I just can't see how a change in leader at the top of the Tory party brings that about when there's an election David, coming do you think, the corner. Uh, do you think, to, to paraphrase Path, that actually it doesn't matter what the Tories do, that they're, they're a done deal, that it's finished, we need another, an, another, we need a change of government? Is that where you are, David? I think we're, we're, any any time there's an election, there's a manifesto produced. And let's say that Penny Morgan does become leader, and let's say that she produces a manifesto that's effective for the country that we live in today. So she could still I win think. your vote? Well, it has to be done on that manifesto. OK, OK, brilliant. David, thank you for kicking off the conversation. 0344 499 1000. Now, I very, very rudely cut you off so we could take David's call, but I can't remember what you were going to say. Do you know what you were going <laughs> no, to say? I can't remember. Oh, there you go. That no. was brilliant distraction, that David wasn't said it, it better than I. Yeah, he, well, he's, yeah. he's, he certainly, did, he, he certainly did, a, did address that. Can I just test you a little bit on um, the, the, the question of MPs' pay? Mm. Um, because it's always been a bit of a toxic question. I mean, it really goes back to even Margaret Thatcher's day when she didn't think it'd be a good idea to increase salaries, increased expenses, and we all know where that ended up mm -hmm. in 2009 and 2010. It's gone to an independent pay body. And in a way, the MPs, they genuinely don't have any control over it. So are you happy to pay our MPs what is a significant amount of money, £91,000, I think it is, mm. uh, this new pay rise will be, which includes a, 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 a pay rise above inflation. Are you, are you comfortable with that level for our MPs? I, th I think there's two things to consider here, Nick. Right. The first is um, when the outcomes of this independent body that's been deciding MPs pay since 2009, when the outcome of that seems slightly unfair or there's an air of unfairness about the decision they've reached, it's worth questioning the process. And so what MPs have been awarded is about the same as what senior civil servants have been awarded, which, from, the, from that perspective... Do you mean in percentage terms? Yeah, it's 5.5%. Okay. So that's about yeah. the same as a senior civil servant. And that seems fair if you're a senior civil servant. The point is, most of us aren't. People in this country in general don't make... But should that need. matter? It, sh it matters for, for this reason, for two reasons, actually. The first is, most people in this country have seen a real squeeze in their spending power over the past years. Like, the, maybe one of the biggest squeezes in recent history. And so that is a, a reason as to why they might feel this is unfair. But the second thing, and this is a really important point, I think, is that your experience of the world shapes your view of it. That matters for MPs more than most people because they make decisions on all of our behalves. And so if their experience of the inflation crisis, their experience of the cost of living crisis is so different to the experience of most people listening to this But doesn't joke. that... I mean, it's a, that affects their decisions. It's a really, really important point you're making, and I'm, mm. I'm not saying that uh, w with too big a butt, mm. but I would say, someone like me, I went into Parliament at the age of 50. Mm. I knew what it was like to be very short of money. I knew what it yeah. was like to face pressures of cost of living. Um, I knew what it was like to be unemployed and, and come out of college and have no prospect of getting a job. Isn't it the life experiences that shape us on our journey to Parliament mm. that should be you know, of more importance necessarily than the pay they get? Com completely agree with that. And that's when the pay question becomes relevant again. Because mm. if £91,000, right, is that too much? The answer to that basically depends on who you think we need more of in Parliament, mm. right? So if you think we need more lawyers, and more management consultants, Which and, more, and more, more executives. There's room for them, but yeah. I don't think we need more of them. Well, then you need a salary that's competitive with yeah. those jobs, yeah. right? But if you yeah. think we need, actually, maybe we need more teachers or care workers or cab drivers, 
well then you don't need to make the pay higher than 91,000. If anything, it's disadvantaging people from those backgrounds because you're encouraging more lawyers to come in. We, we, we don't need people with but, backgrounds of Rishi Sunak, I would argue, in Parliament, but probably have enough of them. And we've seen a rise in people like those I kinds of backgrounds. I think the important thing is the spread there. Yeah. So I've always believed that you know you, it should be the spread of both backgrounds, uh, experiences, work, mm. you know, I don't, uh, wherever it kind of came from. I mean, in, yeah. in many ways, to me, that is what makes a better parliament so people can stand up and say, Oi, guys, you got this wrong. Listen, we've I think obviously... we completely agree on that, we, we, you know, I know, the, but, the spread but today that is doesn't wrong. mean I've gone centre-left, OK? <laughs> just to be clear about that, like most of the production team. Um, let's go to Chris in Hereford. Hello, Chris. Hi. Hello. Welcome. How are you, all right? I'm very, I'm very fine. well, Chris. I wanted to get your call in before the break, so far away. Right, it's basically about Penny Morden. I think they should put, put Penny Morden as uh, leader of the Conservative Party. They've tried everybody else. They tried they, they tried Sunak. They tried Trust. They tried anybody else. And I think she's a she'll be a very good she'll be a very good uh, leader of the Conservative Party because she's she's got she'll grab the party by the scruff of the neck and, and I think she's a really good speaker and I, I she'll get my vote. I, I'm not going to vote Conservative next. In, well. If Penny Barnes made leader, I will vote Conservative next in general election. If not, I will not. They will not get my vote. Chris, that's really, really interesting call. You obviously feel very strongly about that. Uh, just let me give some context. Is there, is it anyone but Sunak for you, or uh, is there anyone else, or is it actually no? I like the idea of Penny. That's good. That's it for me. Uh, I, you know, I think Penny's uh, had a lot of bad press, and I what David Cross about said about her as being lazy and all that. Yes, I interviewed her about that on this station, actually. Yeah, yeah. and the opinion polls are absolutely diabolic. The Conservative Party have got nothing to lose. They, they, they just might as well just... Uh, I think it's too late now, but should be good. I think she'll be good as a leader of opposition as well. Chris, next time I see Penny, I'll tell her that Chris in Hereford is um, is is up for that. Really interesting thoughts. Please yeah. keep them coming in. I'm asking how might a change in leadership help the Tories? Coming up, I also see, um, hopefully we'll be talking to someone in Germany about MPs' pay, which I think will bring us round to uh, the conversation coming up uh, after the break. You can join this conversation on these subjects and more. Have you experienced how just awful our social care is in this country and I'm not belittling the efforts of those working in it okay I'm talking about the difficulty of having uh, even been able to find somewhere of getting any support for it or actually even now just finding the right care for the right relative it's actually a baby boomer problem many people of my age have parents living way beyond we thought they would and there is a price to pay financial and emotional how difficult has it been for you? 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. And it certainly has got you talking. I'm grateful for that. You make this show what it is and you make it fun. Uh, how might a change in leadership help the Tories? 0344 499 1000. Already had calls on that subject. I've thrown into that the question of MPs' pay, uh, where um, I don't think I was really disagreeing with you, was I, Path, on that mm. one? That, that, that I'm actually content with the level it's gone up to. By the way, I was nearly £30,000 less when I left Parliament in 2015. So it has actually had quite significant rises, which were con controversial at the time. But how do we compare with other parts, with our neighbours in Europe? And to get a head start on that conversation, it was something I was going to talk about. Theresa is in Germany. Hello, Theresa. Hello. How are you? I'm very well, and thank you for calling. Um, I was going to talk about comparable rates for MPs in other countries, but I think you've probably beaten me to the push here. Yes, I looked it up, and it's 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 like comparing apples to oranges. Mm, mm. You, because what you don't also compare, you don't compare the the average salary, for example, mm. in Germany mm. is fourteen thousand, and the average salary in UK is thirty three thousand. Does does that only matter if we think MPs should be? either earning or linked to the average salary of the country they represent? No, no. What my point was is was that you were... Just let me just uh, put your toes on. Yes, I think uh, that's right. I was... Yeah. What I was comparing it, saying was that if you, if you compare it to the salary in a different country, mm. what the German government gets, you're not... It's not accurate because what they need in a different country depends on what the cost of living is. And the cost of living in Germany, let me tell you, is quite expensive. Is, would, you, would you comfortably say it's more expensive than here, though? In the UK? Yeah. I, I, you may not have been here for a while, so, so it'd be difficult to say. Well, yeah, well, I usually come back about once a year. So I, visit, I, visit, I have friends who live in Scotland okay. and I, I go and visit Well, in her. Germany, um, I believe it's €96,000 a year for an MP. Um, and this, this, this doesn't... They're not meant to make any expenses out of that. They're separate to running their offices and everything. Um, would you be surprised to hear that uh, whilst that is probably just under what the new salary for our MPs would be. Would you be surprised to hear that the highest country, uh, highest payments for MPs in, in European countries is Italy at €170,000 a year? And I don't think the cost of living in Italy is double what it is here. Oh, I agree with you. I, I, I was not... Um... I, I agree with you on that one. It, it, 
but then again, isn't Italy bankrupt in some well, way? Well, you could say, um, and I'm, I'm sure Path will correct me here, but they've been very well rewarded for having a pretty inefficient economy, as I understand it. It may be growing now compared to the pandemic, but it's not actually all sweetness and light there. I would certainly agree with you. I, I, it's a long time since I was in Italy, about five years ago, so I wouldn't, I couldn't com, com, com talk about Italy. But actually, my actual, I agree, I looked up how much they get. The German government, the German Bundes, Bundes yep. politicians get 10,000 and something a month. Yes. And then I multiplied by that by 12. So it's more than I, I said. Yes, and it's one hundred and eight thousand. Actually, I stand corrected. Yes, I'm sorry. My, that date, that is actually a few years old. That one. So you're right. It's more like one hundred and twenty thousand, which is um, more right. than we're getting here. I did. I did actually do the comparison. I did actually use Google. To, you know, Google, yeah, sure. Um, Doctor Google. Do the sound. Doctor Google. Yes. Do you think it's? Do, let me just ask you this final question. Do you think ninety-one thousand pounds? is a fair amount to pay our MPs. I don't disagree with what you're, you're getting. I don't think that... Uh, it's not me anymore, I, I just hasten to add. I, 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 I'm not an MP oh. anymore, but thank you. No, 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 I understand that. And um, I understand that you should be paid... Uh, MPs should be paid a comparable salary to... to um, because they're, they're in a position of power, shall we say. Yeah. So well, they have big decisions ways, to make. Yeah. They have big decisions to make and they're responsible to, for their their constituents okay. and the rest of it. So it's important, but they have to... But don't compare what you're getting to, like, France... I, I take Germany your point about the cost of living and we should look at the median salaries, perhaps. Listen, great. Teresa, thank you for giving us... A I mean, she's absolutely right to think in terms of, of the economy and so forth. But when you look at Italy, which is probably now... Uh, Germany's 120,000. Italy is still around 170,000. And we're, we're only playing catch-up to... Well, we're well behind, aren't we? I, I, I just get this sense 91,000 is fair. No-one is agreeing with me, I have to say, who's texting us. Um, what, what is it about MPs that attracts so much criticism that leads people to think they should, as Barry says here, they should hang their heads in shame at the very idea. And that others are saying it doesn't matter how many you pay, um, how, how, whatever you pay an MP, you're still not going to get the sort of calibre or representation you deserve. It's, it's a general downer on MPs. It's not good for democracy, is it? No, it's definitely not good for democracy, but it's understandable. You know, people are so disappointed both with the quality of governance that they've experienced in this country since, sort of, let's say, the past 20 years, but also the quality of representation. People feel that MPs and parties have drifted away from them in the views they represent, the communities they sit in, and they're right to do so. That You can literally see that in the data. And so that's what's motivating this sentiment. In terms of the, the money question, I think it's... I think it's genuinely just a bit arbitrary to compare it to a, another European nation. You can compare it to France, where But it's we do lower. with everything else. If, if I was in here telling you doctors don't deserve any more money, you'd probably say, but look at what they're getting in Australia. Look what they're getting in France. They can go and do that, can't uh, they? So I would say the way to set wages is to work out who you want to drive into the job, right? It's not about where you, what, what you're paid in a different country. But should country. we do that? Now, come on, we this is an interesting break. Democracy yeah. surely is anyone who wants to be an MP could become an MP. I don't mind in theory, what they but do. not in practice. Well, maybe. But then why... But isn't it a step too far to start for you and I to pontificate from this studio the type of people who should go into Parliament? Because some people would say, keep the Lee Andersons out of there. I mean, let's not go into the issues around No, no, that, it, but, it's actually exactly for well, me and you to pontificate who should get into Parliament but, as but, citizens of the United Kingdom. They are our representatives. You used to be one of our former representatives and it was absolutely in my right to support or not support you. And that is what it but means to be a citizen. But that's what we do at elections. But if we're going to set pay to attract a certain type of calibre of person, I would argue that would be wrong and I don't think it's possible either as it happens on pay yeah but I don't think we should be determining that, determining that we choose our local MP yeah. absolutely and if we think they're a bag of rubbish we won't choose them. no but I think we have to be aware of the effects of pay right does the does the pay bracket make the job more or less attractive to a certain person and 
the City of London lawyer is going to be less attracted to the job if it pays 60,000 versus if it pays 500,000. That is quite important. That's almost Which, MP engineering, though. No, it's not MP engineering. It's just working out who, who, who the job is attractive to and who we're trying to make it more attractive. We always talk about having better people in Parliament. What I'm questioning is, what does better people mean? Who do we mean by better people? That's really important. We don't sit here and say, you know what, it's, it's really unfair that a care worker makes seven pounds an hour and a city of London lawyer makes seven thousand pounds an hour. Right? We we could, we don't we don't interfere with that wage setting mechanism really. In the same way, we we, we me and you shouldn't well, sit here and decide. Well, apart from the minimum wage. We yeah, do. but yeah. we we don't we don't decide the MP salary, and I'm, I think that's spot on. I think that is right. I think we're allowed to debate what the effects what the sort of the, the collateral effects of setting the pay too high or too low is and i think that's important yeah i i mean the oldest argument in the book wasn't it is if you when mps weren't paid and they mm. were still just as unpopular by the <laughs> way uh when, when they weren't paid uh it it only allowed really people with a private income to become mm. mps and that's why they started to pay them so yeah. that you could have wider representation agree that was a uh, terrible system i completely agree with yeah that. no it was yeah. it, it was obviously flawed but it was at the extreme but mm. but but if we put pay up to one hundred and fifty thousand, you could have people coming into this job because they're earning thirty thousand now they manage the party system and they're in it for the cash that's the last sort of thing you, you could want. but what i'm saying is it would actually make parliament less representative the trends in parliament over the past 40 years has been a huge reduction in the number of mps from working class backgrounds the number of mps from working class backgrounds has fallen twice What's as quickly someone who's worked a working class job or not been to university yeah, but what is that is that blue collar job is that what you mean no no what it can be a service it? sector job as well so yes blue collar jobs absolutely but also people who've worked as waiters or cleaners or care workers um, in, in general what you might think if, if, if <laughs> well what you might think is a working class job is generally a working class job um, and that's quite important because what we've seen is a rise in the number of people coming from super professionalized backgrounds and a rise in the number of people coming from business backgrounds no bad thing but a real sharp drop in the number of people coming uh, from it's working fascinating class conversation job. I won't go on and on about it because mm. apart from anything else I've got to uh, bring in some breaking news but I would like to hear your views as well about pay I think Path is raising some really interesting influences uh, 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 points about how does it influence people coming into Parliament are you getting the right sort of Parliament you need I will say this I was in uh, Hartlepool for two days on another um, broadcast thing that I was doing and the one message that came out when I was asking it wasn't policy people were talking to me about they were saying they wanted someone who would fight for their area and they could mm. trust. It was the type of person, not necessarily the policy, which I thought was very interesting. Now, just an update on an earlier story. Tesco are now experiencing, Tesco, not Sainsbury's, are now experiencing online issues following on from those that happened to Sainsbury's this morning. It's not known if the two issues are related, and I'll bring you more about that as we get it here on Talk TV. The suggestion I would read into that would be, actually, is there some sort of hack going on? Now, I haven't yet got to the point I'm going to blame the Russians, but it does actually make you think what, what is going wrong if suddenly two supermarkets... It doesn't quite stack up that, does it? It's... Um, it's it's uh, it's it's quite it's quite it's, it's quite it's quite interesting. Um, can we just stick stick with one other subject in Parliament mm. um, uh, before I take another call? It's been suggested that uh, MPs who are accused uh, basically of um, a wrongdoing. I'm trying to keep it as vague as possible. This mm. is in the Express today. Uh, could and not charged. So they haven't necessarily been charged with an offence, would be banned from the House of Commons, um, adjudicated by a committee as to whether the claim is sufficient to do that, not charged, just actually been accused of doing something wrong, uh, until the matter is resolved, either charges not laid forth or charges laid and goes to court. As a Democrat, I'm a bit torn on this because mm. suddenly uh, an allegation could have come in against me saying, I don't know, I stole this, I, I mugged someone or, or, or I've done something quite despicable. It could be a sexual offence or something like that. Um, uh, and I'm immediately banned, even though charges aren't brought against me. And we've kind of seen this with investigations going on with MPs and they haven't been able to represent their constituents and are cleared months later years later i think i think andrew rossendale is one i know he's been cleared of mm. all charges 
Yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's, it's a really tricky issue. Um, and the fact that it is, we've defined it so ambiguously makes it quite hard to make a clear call, right? There's two things that I think are important to remember. First of all, MPs should be subject to the same standards and laws that the rest of us are, the basic rule of law. So innocent until proven guilty is important. And is it safe for them to be in their workplace? And are there risks to people or colleagues or others in their workplace? For example, let's take a teacher. And there's yeah. an allegation of a teacher having of, of some kind of abuse, right? Would you still let the teacher go into school around children or not? Is a good question, right? I think MPs should be held to the same standards. Sometimes the answer is yes, because the allegation is not relevant, and sometimes it's no. And we make those decisions, whether you're a teacher or a doctor or a nurse, people that work with, with people... With they them. could then bring another teacher in yeah. to cover that teacher. Yeah. We don't have an ability to bring another MP in. There's no cover MP, mm. is there? And and it's that representation point. Because yeah. what then really happens is they either try and work behind the scene, but they can't be in Parliament. They can't ask the questions. They can't effectively do their job. Yeah. I think that's what slightly... I, I don't know what the answer is. No, it's tricky. Um, but, but I would have thought it's so unique that they literally are denying their constituency representation. And that that, that I think more than anything else is what troubles me. Yeah, and, the, and there are ways around that, right? You can you can ban the MP who is potentially a risk to other people in Parliament, but still give them a voice in Parliament while investigations are underway. I think that's certainly possible. We do that with MPs who have recently had children, for example. So that's not out of the question. What, I think you it mean is they important. could ask questions remotely from home or something yeah. like that? I yeah. do, oh, it's a big ask, I must yeah. say. But yeah, but we have to remember that there has been almost a litany of scandals in Parliament in yeah, recent years. Yeah, but you see, you're quite young. To be honest, I could go back to, like, the 70s and I remember... That doesn't make it acceptable. No, 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 no. But <laughs> yeah. it's almost your implication there was, oh, it's just this shoddy lot at the moment. No, that it's wasn't my really. implication. Okay, no, fair no, 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 no. I'm just saying that, that it's clearly become an okay. issue that people are more aware of, and it is absolutely right we act on it. Parliament needs to be a fair and safe workplace. And at the moment, it's not. OK, afterwards, let's, uh, let's talk social care. You can join the conversation 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, Nick, it's not the 91,000 salary for the MPs, it's the fiddling of expenses that is disgusting, uh, says Unspoken. Yeah, but I, I don't think there is hard much going on. I mean, if they are, they seem to get rooted out now. It was absolutely disgusting. Nick, are these Tory MPs that want to force Penny Morden onto the nation the same clowns that forced Sunak onto us, says Adrian? Uh, afternoon, the salary of the MPs is not the issue, it's the fact they do nothing of any use. They just look like freeloafers grifting at our expense. I can't accept that. Some are rubbish, but then some teachers are rubbish, some policemen are rubbish, as we all well too know. You're absolutely right. But most of the ones that I know work very hard. Now that may or may not be linked to salary, but this generalisation, I honestly don't think it actually wins the argument. Um, particularly when it comes to pay. Hi, Nick. People struggling with the cost of living crisis. Why should MPs get a pay rise when the voters don't get one? It's greed, says Andy in Wiltshire. But Andy, this is what the public wanted, an independent pay body for MPs, and it's taken their salary from 65,000 up to about 91,000. MPs can't reject it even if they wanted to. They might be able to give it to charity, but that's it. Karen, how will a change of leadership help the Tories? It won't. We have had enough. You were part of the problem. Hang your weak head in shame. I think that's me, really. I'm not quite sure I'm part of the problem uh, there. You'll have to explain that to me. I left Parliament in 2015. If performance-related pay was given to MPs, they would all be living on the streets, says Karen. So I don't think I was part of the problem there, but I'm happy to have you call in, Karen, 0344 499 My big question, how might a change in leadership help the Tories? 0344 499 Let's talk social care. OK. Um, both parties, you would have thought they'd be talking about it. It's blocking up our hospitals. Quality of life for people is absolutely dreadful. It's draining uh, people of my generation, certainly, up to 1,500 quid a week to pay for a care home. It's a place that's in crisis, and we also are paying some of the lowest salaries in the country to the people we're entrusting our older people to. I mean, it's bonkers. What's gone wrong and what could be done realistically from your perspective? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with every single thing you just said there, Nick. Um, it, is a, it is a catastrophe. Um, and there is there are two causes, I think. One is our society is changing. In general, we're getting yep. older, we're getting sicker. Propped up by pills, keeping us alive, perhaps when in the past it wouldn't have done. I mean, that sounds awful, but... Yeah, well, that's, that's some part of the story. But in general, we're, we're, we're not taking the, seri the issue seriously enough, right? A lot more people in society need care. Mm. And if anything, we've got fewer caregivers. That is both a rise in demand and a fall in supply. Why on earth have we let that happen? And why are we still letting it happen? As you said, the main political party, in fact, every political party just kicks the can down the road. It's in the too hard box. Because we had a thing called the Dilnot Report. We've had so many since, yes. Uh, have we? Okay. Yeah. Oh. It, oh, there's, there's probably been about but 21 government commission reports. Boris had an oven-ready deal, he didn't he? Did. He did. He promised an oven-ready deal, and then he too had put it in the too hard box. It constantly runs into challenges around financing, and we get stuck in how do we fund it, and we don't even ask what does good care look like. And this is actually where comparisons to other countries is quite useful. Right, Japan is a good example because the country is not only so much older than ours, it has a much smaller working age population. Despite that, every single person at the age of 65 gets um, a social care review. They have a much more expansive range of services but they can access. there's a cultural difference there. They fundamentally respect their, um, the elderly there. I, I, I'm, I'm not talking claptrap here. I was in Japan on business many years ago and they, people talked kind of the learning and reverence they held elder people in. We tend to shuffle older people off. I say it sounds cruel, and I'm self-interested in this, but I genuinely don't think this nation knows how to look after older people, whether they're sick or ill. I, I'm or, not sure or I agree with that. I think most 
people really value their older relatives and I think they do want the best care possible for their parents or their uncles or their aunts or their grandparents. I think the problem is that there's, they don't really know where to go. It's so hard to navigate the social care system. The threshold for even get, being, accept, being allowed to have care is quite high and it's getting higher. But and then this, you have to pay for it unless you're in a Let's very go back to basics. Group. What does good care look like then in, in your views? And how much should the state be part of the solution and not the families? I mean, it's mm. our responsibility. We are paying that care. Um, you know, th what's wrong with that? And I like how you separated those two questions. So I think it's really important we do. We jump in with the second, you know, we just jump in with like, well, who's providing it? And we just need to start with, well, what does good care look like? Good care is probably care that's personalised to, to you in a place that you want to call home. It's not... Where you want to be, if you yeah, can. Yeah, it's not the 10 minutes rock in, sort of change your clothes, make you a microwave lunch and rock out because you've got so many other clients you need to get to for a day and you're paid £7 an hour. That is absurd. It is... Let me take Shouldn't you to the park. Should they be paid the minimum wage? You keep saying seven pounds an hour, but I know the minimum wage isn't seven no. pounds an hour. It's well, it's because you're not paid in between your travelling. So say I have oh, to. Oh, okay. You're yeah. I'm talking about in. I'm sorry. I'm talking about in care in homes. Yeah. Okay, so fine. yeah, the average carer, but they make, they can make more. Not a lot of them don't actually make the minimum wage, but they are not paid in between their travel times. Their travel costs are not yes, reimbursed. No, that, it, there I get there that. are issues there, which is why I've reduced it. Um, However, the point is, right, we, 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 the social care should be, actually, if you're an elderly person and you like a stroll around your local park, the carer should be able to help you do that. And most carers want to be able to do yes, that, but yes. we don't let them. We don't have aspirations high enough, and we need to really define that. And I encourage the next parliament to think so deeply about this issue. Then there gets onto the question, was like, well, how do we actually finance that? How do we do mm. that? Who employs care workers? Is it local government? Is it private companies? To what extent is this something we can rely on external people? And to what extent is this a family-based question? Those are really difficult moral questions. I don't have an answer. You don't have the answer. It should no. be deliberated and, over in Parliament and debated. And you should be able to read across party consensus on it, to be honest, but they've been slagging each other for death taxes and, and, and dementia taxes. Think anywhere. Let's take a call from Martin. Martin, hello. Hello, Martin. Can Martin hear? Is he gone? OK, let's try, let's try Terry in Dover. Hello, Terry. Well, good afternoon, Nick. Hi, good to talk to you. What would you like to say? Yeah, on your central question about yes. um, would a change of leadership benefit the Tories? Yes. Um, I think before you even start thinking about that, you've got to think about some basic issues here. A apparently, you can confirm this, uh, uh, there are 40% of people undecided, OK, in opinion polls. Now, th 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 that would probably make up this... 20, 25% deficit to bring, possibly bring them back to, to, to level. I think most of those uh, people uh, will probably veer towards conservatives. The trouble is, Nick, you, you, you've, the Tories are not going to win going right wing, are they? They've got to try and go one nation. Because young people now, most of them, are voting socialist or anti-capitalist. How do you win those back? You can make a housing offer to them, um, and, and, and uh, if, if, if you reduce income tax, then they'll say, oh, well, no, we should spend more on, on public services. So it's very, very difficult to... Terry, to hold, hold on a second, because I want to put this point to path. It is interesting. I think there has been this sizable shift in public opinion, not necessarily all the people um, uh, who, who, who tune in and listen and watch here, but actually people seem to want to spend more on public services. I have a real problem with that because I think the money's spent really badly. But but mm -hmm. is that is that true, Parth? That's spot on, yeah. The, the, the polling data for quite some time now has shown and a majority in this country would prefer we spend more on public services, even if that means people pay more taxes. And that's a real big shift from, let's say, two or three decades but, ago. The politicians have not picked it up. They were almost looking at it and ignoring it. And that's another democratic deficit. Because there's a huge amount of people will now be shouting at me and you saying they're spending the money really badly. And that, I think, is true as well. And that, that's our taxes that have been spent in a very bad way when I think about it. Of course, public services could be better spending money. Of course, every government could be better spending money. And that is a question that is absolutely worth asking. But just better spending the amount of money already available isn't enough if we want to deliver a solution to social care, for example. And we need to have those hard questions. The problem is no one in Parliament or no politician well, of any party wants to bring up no, those questions. And we're all going to be paying more tax after the election, despite what they tell you. That's my, my view. Terry, um, Terry, the politicians aren't grown up to have the conversation you want, basically. 
I Sorry, think, what was that, Nick? I don't think the politicians are grown up enough to want to have the conversation that you yeah. want to have. Well, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because there's not much clear blue water between them now. And, um, you know, um, a certain amount of ideology is gone. It's, it's how can we make the best offer to win enough votes to, to, to be, be, you know, become elected? But okay. there's another point, Nick. Very, very briefly, Terry, because I want to get Martin back in. He's come yeah, back on the line. Yeah, I just point, uh, the one question, one thing here is that, um, you know, uh, to people consider... Um, how the, the Labour could well be worse on all these things. West Street is quite strong on the health service, but on the boats, on the economy, um, on, on the green issues, OK, young people go for green, but older people don't want it so much. It's very, very difficult, Nick, isn't it? To, well, I think that's the choice people are going to have to make. Terry, you've nailed it in a way. And this is the Conservative strategy in my mind. It's actually, will things get enough, better enough for people to say, do you know what? We know they're useless, but I'm going to stick with them because I'm really not sure that Labour lot are going to do any better. It's that fear of the unknown, and I suspect deep down that is a little bit of the thinking in Conservative central office. I can't give you time to answer that one yet. Martin, very briefly, before I go back to um, Path for the last word, thank you for hanging on. What would you like to talk about? Hey, good afternoon, Nick, and good afternoon, Dr Park. Uh, I just uh, wanted to clarify, this independent pay body yes. is not an independent pay body. Why not? It's dictated to you by the government, by the budget that is supplied to them for them to be able to pay any raises or reductions. And that doesn't apply to the same independent body when it comes to MPs, because MPs dictate their own budget for their own pay, the same way they do for any other pay raise for any other part of the public sector. That's unfair. And where is the accountability? We get paid. Uh, as normal people, they provide a service, whichever uh, aspect of employment we're in. And he don't have that. And then when they're caught doing anything, they're suspended with full pay, normally pushed out of the party. Yeah, but that's true of so many pay. walks of life, particularly in the well, public sector, know, Martin. I walk of life. If I'm found to be faltering in my job, I get fired, I lose all my benefits and I lose my pension. Well, if you do that's gross misconduct, if you do, uh, Martin, if you do gross misconduct, you will be fired. But there's so many protections for employees in place now, it's actually quite hard to fire people. But let me go back to your central point. Can I ask you... You just stated there now they're absolutely useless, but we've no... Why are we paying for useless Well, no, I, I, I don't... And, 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 I, I, I was talking about the Conservative government, which is slightly different to MPs, OK, because they have okay, been... OK, well, the Conservative government is the, the ruling party, the ruling majority party. Yeah, but there's a difference, OK. on TV to be calling them useless, and their wages have gone up by more than... Well, yeah, but there's a big difference between MPs and government. For example, over half of the parla uh, half of the, half of the House of Commons are not anything to do with the government. So I think it's worth okay, remembering we are talking about MPs. Can you tell me another career in the last 10 years with everything that's happened to this country with Brexit? Yep, yep. And go on, go on. Uh, somebody's salary's gone up by over 30%. Yeah, um, probably hospital chief executives is a good one. Martin, you raise a no, really good point. I'm going to give I'm going to give Path a chance to come back on that. Thank you. Um, what did you think? Uh, it is independent, isn't it? It's, a... it's an independent body, but Martin's actually right that the terms of reference mm -hmm. is, is set by the government. So there's a, there's a question about how independent this body is. But what I was really thinking about when Martin... They could was come speaking, in with less, though, couldn't they? They, they could. They, 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 that's the point, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but Martin really, I think, hit the nail on the head when he was talking about the accountability gap. His sense of frustration, I think, is something that's felt sort of widely across the country. People feel that the, the people in Parliament are just cut, that come from a different world. You know, the, the, those who govern yes, us totally agree with are that. not the same totally agree as, with that. as the rest of us. And that's really counterintuitive but isn't to the that basic what elections principle of democracy. You're, you're, you do a lot of work on democracy. That is what elections are for. That's why people get kicked out, one of the reasons. Right, right. But what, what people are feeling right now is that all the options is on, on the table aren't Mm. Um, are, are too detached Spot on. from what, and that's new. That's changed. Parties have become less representative, and you need to really deeply. Think I about that. I met with a, a a Labour advisor who told me he said, of course, in '97 when Blair won, people were sitting outside their houses chatting, having a beer. There was a little bit of a carnival atmosphere. That oh, it's big. After many years of Conservative government, it's changed. Got he said this time that won't happen. People are going to go in and vote. Oh, OK, we'll give them a chance. There is going to be no sense, a real sense of hope for change. I think that's what's missing, and I think that's what's real price here. People vote for hope normally. I think they're going to vote this time, but not necessarily 
in the belief that hope will be paid off. Yeah, and people have lost the belief that the future is susceptible to sort of their influence. And that's a, a dangerous place for democracy. I suspect the election coming up will have a low turnout. Are you going to be busy between now and the election? I will no, be busy. Got lots of policy papers busy. coming out. I do hope people turn up to vote, but I, I, I think but the signs from what I'm seeing so far is it's going to be a very low turnout election. Where, where, where would you, just last question quickly for you, uh, where are you focusing your policy efforts as the IPPR trying to shape the next Labour government, presumably? We're, we'll, try and, we'll shape the next parliament regardless of what the government looks like. And we, we have a very basic, simple goal to make the country richer and fairer. We're, we strive towards prosperity and but justice. But it's the means of getting there that everyone will debate, of course. Right. Um, and yeah. we need to rethink our economy. Is the starting point. Well, that's true. I remember David Cameron saying that in the 2010 manifesto as well. Dr. Parath Patel, senior research fellow who leads work on democracy and political reform at the Institute for Public Policy Research. It's been a real pleasure having you here. No one's told you to shut up or get off the air. I'm really pleased. You should be worried. You may have centre-right tendencies. Now, that would be concerning. Or you have centre-left ones, then. Uh, coming up, <laughs> Putin. He says Russia is ready for nuclear war over Ukraine. Is he bluffing? Well, I suspect he is. Uh, and there is an election there, after all, of sorts. We'll find out more with Defence Editor at the Evening Standard, Robert Fox, and former NATO commander, Rear Admiral Chris Parry. That and more will be coming up. Lots of you sharing your views with me. 90 years, plus expenses, plus research jobs for the family, plus second jobs, businesses, TV work, journalism. No wonder MPs are willing to lie through their teeth to get in says Glenn. No lack of cynics here today. I will continue to fend our system and even the pay, but not all MPs. You can join the conversation 0344 499 1000. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter. Find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 p.m., only on talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, it's here. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. the ghost of Margaret Thatcher. She said, you've got to watch. That was the woke that was 10 o'clock Saturday night with Lizzie Cundy, Henry Bolton, Pete Barnes, and of course, the woke woman! Welcome back. My main question, how might a change in leadership help the Tories? 0344 499 1000. I'm asking a penny for your thoughts and we'll be talking about that throughout the show, of course. A couple of messages in before I go to Putin and Russia on social care. Uh, and I'm really grateful for these messages, so thank you for sending them in. Uh, my mother had a stroke three years ago and has been residing in a nursing home ever since. She's now very disabled, cannot communicate at all and had quite bad brain damage doubly incontinent, basically in quite a state. However, continuing healthcare decided she is not poorly enough for them to pay for her continuing care and at the moment costs her just under £6,000 a month. So far she has to spend nearly £200,000 on her care. She had to sell her house to pay for this. That is all the money she had in the world. I just don't understand how this is even deemed remotely fair. Boris said he had an answer and kept it. Uh, however, uh, they didn't keep their promises. Nobody keeps their promises. And it's us poor working class suckers. Then I'm really sorry, the message disappears after that. And I can't see who sent that. But listen, if you do want to call, please do. 0344 499 1000. I have another message from Sarah there, which I'll also read later. Now, um, Vladimir Putin. That great Democrat who's having elections uh, this weekend, yes, I'm being sarcastic, told the West on Wednesday that Russia was technically ready for nuclear war and that if the US sent troops to the UK, it would be considered a significant escalation of the conflict. Um, I'm very pleased to say we're going to talk to someone who will know and, be, shall we say, perhaps in the mind of what's going on there. Robert Fox, defence editor at The Evening Standard. I nearly said, Robert, you'd be in the mind of Putin, but that, I think, is a stretch too far and would be unfair to you. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Uh, when this threat was made, we obviously heard a lot about it. Uh, what's 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 behind this? Is it is it tough talking pre-election stuff, um, saber rattling that we've come to use, or should we take it seriously? Should we be worried? Well, ever since the conflict really began, particularly after the in and around the invasion of Ukraine um, uh, in February 2022, the nuclear element has come up and there is no doubt about it that Putin thinks of this because it's part of his his his, his offer as a big powerful imperial uh, czarist figure this is what he is recreating um modeled partly on the czars partly on stalin is a new imperium of 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 russia um now down to the practicalities, the tactical pr pr practicalities, and Chris will probably be better informed about this. It's very, very difficult indeed to see the circumstances in which you could use um, uh, medium range or even tactical weapons. And on the longer range stuff, he's got China breathing down his neck and they really do not want Putin mucking around with intercontinental nuclear warfare at, at, at all. So. There is something in it. There is a, some real political thought behind it. And by the way, with the election, we have to watch or listen very carefully as to what he's going to say afterwards, because I think he may be going to say an awful lot, which is going to put us on our metal. But this is setting out his stall. I'm big and tough. Don't blow the house down. Um, but we're doing OK. That's the other message. We're doing OK after some setbacks um, in Ukraine, although I must say I, I find it very difficult to uh, conceive of Bakhmut and then now Avdivka, which uh, the Ukrainians have given up as huge 
uh, strategic victories. No, they are, they are in some ways unnecessary and very, very bloody battles for both sides. Uh, t tell me, just uh, thinking the, the, the sort of behaviour through uh, I I in his message to people, we know he's always been very machismo. He's always, you know, I think we've had in the past, he's ridden horses semi-naked to show off his chest and all, all this sort of stuff. But um, what I kind of found interesting in all of this was uh, it seemed to be a case of um, I want to alarm and continue to divide opinion in Europe uh, over how you deal with me. Because I know there are divisions already. Is this meant to cause problems at home? Does he envisage that we'll all be out on the streets protesting about and demanding peace or something? Well, he's got a very useful friend, I won't say useful idiot, but in the old Marxist terminology, in Viktor Orban, and he has got elements of the really hard over, I don't like saying hard right, but extreme right, but really hard over right nationalist, isolationist uh, element, things like the alternative for Deutschland. And there is no doubt about it that there is a big effort, there's a big overt and covert effort through Europe to get these stirred up to demonstrate. Very interestingly, he's not being very successful in uh, instrumentalizing protests over Gaza mm. towards the Russian cause. And Russia, in, to some extent, is caught over the Israel a Gaza crisis. But you're quite right. He's saying a split. You see, that it's meat and drink to him that you have the Pope saying what he did in the Swiss radio. Uh, Just remind us with. what that was. Well, it, it was a very strange interview, and somebody formally as politically astute as the Pope saying, oh, it's time to raise the white flag, thinking only oh, that just means a signal that I'm prepared to talk. He knows. Nonsense. Uh, Francis knows exactly what he's talking about. He 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 survived the very nasty dictatorship in, in Argentina. And it reminded me like, of the famous thing of Stalin in the war. How many divisions has the Pope? when the Pope was was, uh, was I I intervening or not in World, World War II. Um, the thing that went wrong, and I'll be, again, interested in Chris's view on, the, on this, I think was the Tucker Carlson interview. Yeah. The Tucker Carlson interview turned out to be pantomime, and Putin knew it. He knew it immediately he came off air. He was, he was very, very dismayed with Carlson. He was angry, but beyond angry, he was dismayed at how lightweight, how, how groveling. And he said, you didn't ask me any qu hard questions. And he wanted to be asked hard questions because he was going to lay out his store for his diplomatic track. So, he's still got a diplomatic track, you, uh, you, you, uh, you see. But I think that we're going to have the, the strategy the strategy for now you see me, now you don't for Ukraine, but also the disruption from the Arctic through to the Gulf will come after this election. Uh, listen, Robert, thank you very much. You kept mentioning Chris there, I should explain. We've got um, uh, Rear Admiral Chris Parry joining us soon uh, to pick up on those points. Thanks so much for setting out what is going on and the thoughts behind that. It's Robert Fox, Defence Editor at the Evening Standard. Uh, and we'll be going to Chris in a minute to talk, talk about that. I think it's quite interesting what he said about the Tucker Carlson interview. He obviously knew he had a bit of a patsy journalist there, uh, but obviously wanted to be grilled harder. Uh, and it might very well have meant we would have even heard of this nuclear threat then during that what has become rather um, ridiculous interview that was carried out by Tucker Carlson. Uh, so uh, I'll explore that. But I also want to explore, as he suggested, um, Putin was suggesting that, and I think he used these words. It's quite interesting. He said, we have made much more progress here with our nuclear arsenal. It's more modern, either implying he didn't think it would work or they could use it effectively in the past. The question remains, you know, how formidable is he at the moment? So uh, for my mind, uh, already a couple of texts coming in on this. Tony in Liverpool says, Nick, Russia Russia is clearly winning and NATO has run out of weapons and munitions. This is the reality. It's a point I'll put to uh, Chris, Chris Parry, who were, um, I think is now ready to join us. Uh, so, 
Ah, OK. No, my screen is not telling me the truth. Um, so uh, Chris isn't quite with us. Let's take uh, Anne in Hertfordshire and then hopefully we'll be able to speak to Chris. Anne, hello. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. Thank oh, you for holding hi. on. You'd like to talk MPs pay? Yeah, I want to talk about the MPs pay. I... I just find it astounding that we're in a cost of living crisis and people are struggling to pay their bills, like myself, I'm a pensioner, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm paying my bills, but it's a struggle, but I'll get there eventually. But they're rewarding themselves for failure. And I think it's absolutely disgusting. And, listen, How dare they do that? I'm going to do a favour. I'm going to leave you with a thought and we're going to go back to you because my next guest we've managed to connect with now. So my sincerest apologies. We will call you. Okay. But I just want to leave you okay. this one thought because the MP's pay rise was 57 but actually, pensioners, yeah. 65, 66 years on above, they had 8.5%. So let's discuss that yeah. because I think that's a good talking point. Now I'm very pleased to say we've got um, uh, Rear Admiral Chris Parry on the line. Chris, good to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Sorry about those difficulties. You are with us. Um, uh, but a point put forward, actually, in my chat there with uh, Robert Fox, a uh, defence uh, editor, as you well know, from the Evening Standard, he was saying, actually, regardless of the threat of Putin talking about nuclear war, uh, the feasibility of even carrying out strikes is actually not as straightforward. What did he mean by that? Well, I think, uh, obviously, you, you can't talk about nuclear weapons without discussing what the likely impact zones are. But if Putin were to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, most of the fallout, as we saw with Chernobyl, would drift into Russia. Um, so it would be a serious own goal uh, and shooting himself in the foot. Um, so I think that's what he was referring to. But yeah. I think we, we have to consider that what is going on here is a lot of posturing around the time of the Russian election. He's trying to big himself and his country up. Uh, you know, the, the war in Ukraine is on the edge at the moment. Uh, and so every time he gets into trouble, Putin starts flourishing the nuclear sabre. Uh, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, he knows that... Uh, we have sufficient deterrent systems in the free world to say to him, look, whatever you think you're going to gain by using nuclear weapons, uh, we can actually do a lot of damage to you. In fact, probably terminal damage to your regime and all the um, settled parts of your country. He was saying in response, his, his threat came out when he linked it to the idea that if the US sent troops to UK, it would be seen as a, cons a, a significant escalation. What is the likelihood uh, of the US uh, or anyone sending troops to Ukraine, which I presume would be in a combat situation? Well, I think it's no secret that uh, US troops, our own troops, and uh, quite a lot of other European uh, troops are supporting the Ukrainian war from a distance. There's no question mm -hmm. about that. Um, we're already doing that. Uh, I think... Uh, what he's doing is trying to demarcate the dispute to keep uh, it's a Russia against Ukraine uh, war rather than bringing in a, any other people. Um, he's also doing it for the internal um, the internal population in Russia as well. He's trying to generate this idea that NATO's a threat. There isn't much chance of uh, direct combat being undertaken by NATO troops uh, in Ukraine. However, having said that, uh, quite a number of senior figures in the regime, Medvedev and others, Petrushev, are saying, well, actually, um, we rather fancy the Baltic republics and we don't like Sweden and Finland very much. Well, these are members of NATO. Uh, and so he's sort of provoking a, a sort of NATO reaction. But as I said, it's all part of the internal propaganda that keeps his people on side in a very testing time. Tony uh, from Liverpool put a question that I think he'd like me to put to you. Uh, is that uh, his assessment is Russia is clearly winning and NATO is running out of weapons and munitions. That's the reality. I perhaps I'd sort of say the 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 U European will uh, is a divided and seems split at times. But is is this in stalemate? If if not, um, and if no side is winning, or are Russia definitely with the upper hand at the moment? No, Russia hasn't got the upper hand. Um, we'd be seeing a lot more sort of progress on the ground. What they are doing is consolidating within the territories that they do hold. They're murdering people. Uh, they're, they're obviously moving things around uh, in terms of their military uh, and logistic preparations. But there's no sign of a huge counteroffensive against the Ukrainians at the moment. 
You're absolutely right, Nick. What we're looking at is a North Korea, South Korea stalemate, I think, for many years to come now. Uh, and I think all the indications are uh, that the Russians will continue to uh, purge uh, those provinces that they hold. Uh, they'll, they'll try and get hold of Odessa, I reckon, uh, and complete the isolation of Ukraine from the Black Sea. Uh, those are their aims right now. I don't think they have uh, really the power fighting power or indeed the political intention of trying to uh, invade the rest of Ukraine. And uh, for all the noise that we hear coming out of Washington, uh, which has obviously fumbled the ball when it comes to financial aid with what's been going on in, in, in Congress, um, do, 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 do you put much stock by what current, uh, former president and quite possibly next president Trump says either when he claims he could solve the war in one day or by the fact that he th seems to think withdrawal and making it a non-America issue are things we should take seriously. It does sound like leaders in Europe are preparing for that. No, this is, uh, if you read his book, and I'm sure you have, Nick, um, you know, uh, uh, about business, he says, what I do is I show you something with my left hand uh, and then I hit you with my right and this is a classic indication, really, for everybody, including Putin and the rest of us in Europe, that if we don't actually start paying attention uh, to America's role in the world uh, and its ability to influence events, um, then he'll do something dramatic. But it won't be that. America needs the free world as much as the free world needs America right now. So I don't anticipate anything he's saying in this regard. Uh, will have any credence or valency the other side of the election if he comes into power. OK, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Um, a regular to uh, this show, this station, Rear Admiral Chris Parry, thank you for joining us with his views on U uh, Ukraine. I'd welcome your views on Russia and the nuclear war threat. I think we've had it pretty roundly trashed there. But I think the claim that Tony makes and others makes that Russia is winning, I think it's been put to bed there. What do you think? Is that the case? I want to remind you of my key question, uh, and I'm essentially asking you, um, well, will a change of leadership change the fortunes, or how will it change the fortunes of the Conservative Party? 0344 499 1000. In a minute, I'm going to be talking to the Taxpayers Alliance about the question of MPs' pay, which has got a lot of you talking, and I will find time to go through many of the messages as well as continue to take your calls. I know we'll also be speaking to Anne again. Uh, let's uh, let's pick Anne up. Um, oh, no, no, she's not online at the moment. I got a thumbs up there, but that's obviously meant to be a thumbs down. Uh, but we'll get back to her and more of this and the Taxpayers Alliance coming up after the break on MPs' pay. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oh, Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you? laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back. Now let's go straight to Anne in Hertfordshire. Hello, Anne. I was just yeah. pointing. I was just pointing out to you that the MPs, I think, are getting a five point seven percent rise, but yep. pensioners, of which I include myself, um, eight point five. Yep. That's not. That's... Yeah, but they had something like eleven percent the year before, or fifteen percent, or something. They did have a big rise. No. You're quite right. Although, in they fairness, the last got two. To look after people of this country. How does not paying MPs help that? Well, they get paid enough. They, they've got to be happy with ninety-five thousand. If I got paid ninety-five, I think it's ninety. I, I think it's ninety-one. Actually, nothing. I, th I think 91. it's yeah, it's still a lot. I think that you know they're they're, they're behaving disgracefully. They're insulting but, the general public. But, but they Even didn't take the pay rise. I mean, uh, I, a lot of people are going to agree with you, Anne, but in fairness, they have no choice but to take it. it is this independent they, they body? They say, we won't take that. Give it back to the, give it to the nurses. Well, give it to the people involved in the post office scandal. But 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 they, it, it, they, they, they can charge nurses forty five pound a month to park their car at the hospital. Yes, that's uh, ridiculous. No, that is true. But actually, if you took all the MPs' pay rises and, and gave it to, to work. them, hang on, Anne. If you took all the MPs' pay rises and gave it to nurses, you'd barely fund a couple of nurses. Well, no, no that's I'm not true. Saying, Maybe ten or twelve. Every, be fair to people. If they can afford a pay rise for them, they can afford a pay rise for the nurses and other people that want pay rises. But they don't get their pay rises. But the MPs jump in and get theirs. But it's not it's them jumping unfair. in. It's not them jumping it, in. It stinks of, you know, I'm better than you. You don't matter. But would you and say I that about a chief executive of a hospital? A chief executive of a hospital earning 250000 Chief executive of well, a council? That, that's outrageous as well. Why? They're doing the big council, jobs. My rent's just gone up. You know, you talk about me getting a pension rise. My rent on my bungalow went up £45 a month. Oh, I so think, that's my I th rise out the window. I think the rent and the rates are a huge ta council tax. It's yes. a huge backdoor tax. And I, I think it's... Pound a my rent went up by £45 on a disabled bungalow because I'm disabled. And that's my pension gone out the window. Look, it's a really difficult circumstances for you, but I've got to... I, yeah. I keep, I'm going to keep pushing the pushing back on this point i i don't quite understand um why we should why, why bringing down other people's pay is going to yeah. help improve the circumstances that millions no of i don't you... want to bring it down i want them to stay on the 85 95 000. don't take uh, it 91 don't be greedy. No, 91 don't is be the greedy. rise yeah some of them have got two jobs don't mm. be greedy well, I don't think I they should have two the general, jobs. I feel insulted by what they've done. It's an insult to the general public, and they want me to vote for them at the next general election. But my MP, I wrote him a letter six weeks ago... Tell me who that is. ..to ask him something regarding my disability, yeah. and he didn't even bother to reply. And, 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 and who is your local MP? I'm more than... No, I'm being told not to ask this. No, you tell me who your MP is, because if they can't be can't bothered to reply back to you... Clark, where do you live? Clarkson. But don't tell Stevenage. me exactly. Which in where? Stevenage. Stevenage. Oh, Stephen McPartland. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he yeah, should have written back. I wrote him a letter explaining I wanted help to buy a wheelchair. I'll pay for some of it, but I want to know where to go to get this wheelchair so I can get out of my bungalow 
and he didn't even bother to reply. And I tell you, I happen to have his number. I'm not going to call it out here. I'm going to send him a message from, and you tell my production team, don't tell me on air what your second name mm. is. Okay. Oh, no, I've sorted it now. I oh. I've, I've been and bought myself a wheelchair. OK, well, I'm still going to message him and say you should, I need, you should I have need to that. get out of my house. Well, I'm glad you were able to do that. And I think I think we're we're not quite a one on this, but you've started the conversation. And thank you for your yeah. very, very strong views. I truly I respect that. I think they should that. be able to cope on their 95 grand a year wages. Well, they're currently on, I think, about... That. Like you say, there should be no second jobs. No second jobs, no. No second you jobs. Know, I hear we pay, we pay some of them, we pay their okay. rent. Anne, I mean, thank you. You've made your point brilliantly well. Thank you. That's Anne in Hertfordshire. Do you agree with it? By the way, when I say no second jobs, I actually, I don't actually believe that should apply um, to absolutely everything. So if you're a doctor and an MP, keep doctoring. If you work in, uh, in sectors where I think you can still learn more, um, particularly in the voluntary sector or, or, or the third sector, whether it's paid or not, I think you've got a lot to offer. So it's not quite as blank blanket as that. Let's go and talk to my good friends at the Taxpayers' Alliance, Darwin Friend. Hello, Darwin. Hi, Nick. Thanks S for having me on the show. Sorry to keep you there, but you see the size and scale of the problem here. Anne basically said they should stick to the money they've got. They shouldn't be paid any more because there's a cost of living crisis still for many. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. Where does the Taxpayers' Alliance stand on this? Well, I think on this one, I'm with Anne, because I don't think MPs should be accepting pay rises when the taxpayers and people they serve across the country are still struggling to make their own household budgets add up. And but they're getting partially. pay rises, Darwin, aren't they? People? Other people? I mean, pensioners get 8.5% from the 1st of April. They're doing all right as well, aren't they? Well, of course, the way that the pensioners, um, the state pension goes up is calculated a little bit differently to how MPs pay is going up. But I would say that a lot of private sector workers across the country are receiving pay rises nowhere near what the uh, what MPs are going to be receiving. And I think when alongside kind of thresholds in income tax being frozen, which is dragging more people into paying higher levels of tax, We've also got a 75-year tax burden, record tax burden coming up very soon. And I simply don't think it's fair that elected officials should receive pay rises when the people they serve across the country are still really struggling at this time. OK, so I think just about everyone will agree with you uh, on this score. Let's talk about the level of pay a little bit. Uh, because I, this will take their pay to £91,346. Look, uh, you will uh, you will know that there are chief executives of uh, hospitals, of councils, earning shed loads of money. Uh, do you think Parliament has got the salary about right for MPs? Well, I think it does at the minute because as you, I was watching the show earlier and you were talking about kind of the getting a range of people into Parliament. And I think we are getting a range of people, both in terms of their career background, but also in terms of their personal finances. You've got some people that are extremely wealthy becoming MPs. You've got also got other people that haven't got that wealth becoming MPs as well. And I think going back to the fundamental point is that we have got a 75-year tax record tax burden on the way. We're going to be borrowing 80 billion in the next financial year. We're going to see public sector net debt go to around about 100% of GDP. And I quite frankly think that your listeners and taxpayers cannot afford a pay rise right now. Darwin, you're talking almost as if it should be performance related, which might sound attractive. So if you get the economy going well, if you get debt down, we'll give you a pay rise. But you jolly well know that over well over half of the MPs are nothing to do with the government. They have no stewardship of the country they vote for and against legislation. So, I'm, I mean, it's a bit of a misnomer to say how we govern the country should be reflected in pay. The best test for an MP is to hire or fire them an election, not link them to pay, which is effectively what you're doing, isn't it? Well, I understand where you're coming from, Nick, but what I would say is, for example, in the latest budget, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party agreed on the fundamental po point of that budget, which was to cut national insurance. So I think if we were to actually link MPs' pay, ob obviously we can't pay opposition MPs different to MPs that happen to be in the government on their base salary, but if we were to link MPs' pay to, for example, GDP per capita, then it's going to tie pay rises for MPs to the economic decisions that they fundamentally make, which affect all of us as their constituents.
But if you look down a list of GDP capita for Europe, well, the, I just looked at Europe for, for MPs' pay, um, there, 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 is, there is a bit of a correlation. It didn't strike me as being very, very strong. You've got rather weird things where in Italy they're paying them €170,000 to an MP, which um, I think if you looked at economic performance there, you might actually say that that's not worth it. However, that's not in your remit to do anything about. Get me to uh, take me to a slightly wider point here. Um, isn't the best way of putting money in people's pockets to cut tax, be it on VAT, be it on income tax, is, isn't isn't that actually better than whacking up the tax, whacking up the thresholds, then dishing out more public pay? Absolutely, Nick. I completely agree with you. And I think one of the big things that the government could do to really help out people right now so they've got more money in their pockets is to unfreeze those tax thresholds that have been frozen for a couple of years now. And that's meant to continue until, I believe, 2027, 28 and the financial year. And that's going to mean that around about 7 million people are going to end up paying more okay. in tax. Let, let's spell this out for people. It's a bit unfair because I didn't wa warn you we'd talk about this. But can you put some scale to exactly what, has hap what is happening by 27, 28, because you've effectively got a threshold that is the point at which we start paying tax. Below that threshold, we don't pay tax. After that threshold, we start to pay tax. Are you able to quantify precisely the, 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 the if you like, the share of tax that we will be paying more? Because that threshold is sticking there, inflation is going up, um, and, and, and we're going to be earning a bit more, we're going to be paying much more tax. Is there any simple way you can quantify that for people? Yeah, absolutely. And just to give kind of a brief bit of background, as you say, tax thresholds have been frozen. So, for example, the personal allowance, which is after that when you start paying income tax at the basic rate, is around about £12,570. It's been like that for a couple of years since they froze the thresholds. Normally, what should happen is that should go up by inflation. So it's not dragging people who get pay rises at inflation into paying tax. Now, to answer your question directly, Nick, for example, the income tax thresholds they've done, that's set to raise by the end of the freeze about £40 billion a year. Wow. Now, the national insurance tax cuts that they did both in the autumn statement and in the budget come to around about £20 billion of savings. So the net cost as a result of those decisions is the government is actually going to be getting about £20 billion. Brilliantly explained. I knew, you, I knew you would rise to the challenge, Darwin. We're all paying more tax. It's as simple as that. Uh, your views on MPs' pay uh, are, of course, very welcome. Thank you very much indeed to my, go my guest, Darwick Friend, from the Taxpayers' Alliance. They really do some great work. You should sign up to their emails. It might upset you uh, every time that you do that, I promise you. Let's go to Francis in Somerset, who would also like to talk MPs' salary. Hello, Francis. Hello, Nick. Yes, uh, I'd just like to challenge a point you made much earlier in, in your show, uh, where you said that our MPs' salaries compared unfavourably with European MPs' salaries. Well, well, doing a minimum of research, mm. I found that the, the French MPs are, appear to earn less, so do the Spanish, and the German MPs only marginally more. So where does this figures come from that you've got? Uh, to, to be fair, you're absolutely right to challenge me. That isn't quite what I said, because I did say I had a table of it, uh, and we had a caller on, Teresa, who was saying we shouldn't look at a direct comparisons uh, because there's different mean sa me median salaries in each country. So I pointed to those that we were similar to, and I did say we were similar to Germany and France. I don't think there's much difference no, I, between... I, I, I'm between... sorry, Nick, I'm going back about an, an hour or so in your show when you didn't say those things uh, and you just compared yeah. us unfavourably with other European... I, I compared countries. us unfavourably to Italy, who are on €170,000 a year. OK, but let's not do one country. Well, yes, I know. But I then went through a list of them and, and I yeah. highlighted Germany particularly as being, I think it's 120,000, which is, is more than yeah. us. And France, uh, we are close to, as I understand it from the report yeah. in front of me, we are close uh, pretty much to uh, uh, Holland and to Belgium 
uh, and to France. We are, as you say, much less than Spain or Portugal. And by the way, if you want to go further, we're much, much less than Malta as well. So I, I don't... I, look, I'm, I'm happy to be challenged. And uh, uh, if, if you like, I'm sure other callers, if they heard me say that, I'm happy to stand corrected. But the facts I've got in front of me are the ones I've been talking about. But let's go to the substance, Francis. Uh, one caller said we shouldn't even compare ourselves with other countries. Um, do you think we should when it comes to pay of MPs? Um, no, I don't, because I, I think the structure of um, costings... Look at the price of houses in this country. Yes. It's ridiculous. It's crazy, isn't it? Well, in parts of the country it yeah. is. Not everywhere, yeah. by the way. Yeah. I mean, I would say there's a very strong case for paying MPs a fixed salary and just get rid of the expenses system. If they live a certain distance from London, obviously there could be increments for that, like, like the London waiting, et cetera, et cetera. But get rid of the expenses system. Then well, immediately you've cleared millions of pounds spent on administering that system alone. Well, OK, let's, let, we'll come to that point, but let's just take your point about... Um, uh, salaries. So yeah. at the moment, if you're the MP for Hartlepool, I happen to know this because I spent two days up there, uh, you uh, would be on uh, the new salary of 91,000 uh, yeah. and you would be able to buy a two, three bedroom house in Hartlepool for 150,000. So the spending power of that MP is hugely yeah. different to the spending power of anyone in the South East. But you can't really have, can you, a different salary for doing the same job? Yes. Well, let's think about this, Nick. If you look at the, 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 the sort of cross-section of MPs, most of those MPs arrive at the House of Commons hardly needing the salary. They all have houses already. Oh, I think that's, I think that's a bit of a generalisation, but OK. Well, well, it, it, you it, said it, hardly needing the salary. I think, I think they do. But I think it's a valid generalisation. I, I think most... Of, just to run to be an MP, you, you do need money to pay for all your advertising, your flyers. Uh, you well, that's know, normally paid you. for. That's normally, sorry to interrupt, but that's normally paid for by volunteers in your association. They raise money yeah. through events and things. Yeah, but isn't it true that the expenses system itself costs millions to well, run? I don't Which know is, how much IPSA costs, well, but you're well, bound to I, be right. I, I, I've heard some horrendous figures and, and I think to myself how can that be true when or how can that be so when you've only got 625 MPs you know putting expenses in it's not that big a deal so, so where does all this money go but how do you create a salary that will allow you to have a lease on a building that you need for your constituency office probably hire on average three or four people which is what you yeah. do as an MP yeah. Yeah. all the office expenses that go with it you're talking about folding that all up into a salary I'm not really sure that that would work no I'm not no no because those things are already separate are they not no no it's really weird actually I well unless it's changed since my day and I don't think it has MPs pay those expenses out of their salary no it doesn't come out of their salary no what it what it does is you have to claim it you have to have this process someone has to check the lease you've signed someone has to make sure that all those bills you're submitting are legitimate and genuine for the gas the electricity whatever it may be yeah but surely you you, you would delegate most of those responsibilities to the people working for you to free you up. Yeah, to I'm not talking the about the MP doing it. You're talking about, you, you, you know, this expensive system to manage it. I'm trying to explain to you why it's such a complex system. And, and you said at the beginning that we should get rid of the expenses system and roll it up into salary. And I've just given you examples of why I think that that would be virtually impossible to do. Well, I, I think it would be quite possible to do that mm. because you, you could take that out separately and, and the expenses could be could be handed in by those constituency workers and, and well the they are pretty run, much now run the offices, but that yeah. is pretty much how and they have to go to someone and that's ipsa yeah the mp shouldn't see any of that money well they don't this it's a misnomer well, that they I, see the money yeah, i don't see the issue here because i'm saying that they should have a fixed salary and, and not be claiming all these expenses. They do have Someone a fixed salary. The expenses yeah. are not, yeah. Yeah. not the, the vast majority of expenses are for the buildings and, and, um, and the property and the staff and everything. 
the idea that they're pocketing loads of extra money in expenses has gone since the reform that came in in 2010. I, I, I look, I know that they'll be allowed to probably claim mileage and things like that, but um, I'm, I don't, don't think we're talking shed loads of money. Listen, Francis, thank you very much. Really good call. I love to be challenged. Uh, I think he had a point. It would have been easy to misunderstand me, but I'm not so sure about his point about separating expenses and, uh, so, sorry, about expenses and uh, uh, is, is perhaps as, um, is going to hold up as much as we might like. Coming up, something for the weekend. Steve Denyer, 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, it was, supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. So I never um, uh, doubted for a moment that we would disagree on MPs' pay. I could even make the case that they should perhaps be paid more. Uh, but perhaps we won't go quite that far today. I'll just take your views on what you think uh, about their pay rise, taking them to 91346 with an above inflation raise. Still, it's making a good conversation, isn't it? 0344 499 1000. But now, something for the weekend. The man himself, Steve Denyer. Yay! Lovely to be here on a Saturday afternoon, Nick. It, How it are you? Is. I'm very well. This is my last one for a few weeks. I'm you, off on holiday. I'm going anywhere nice? Are it's you allowed to, to tell us? To Thailand. Oh, are you? Have you ever been? No. Uh, yes. Uh, only for two days. My daughter was doing voluntary work out there with yeah. long disabled children. And uh, I went to visit her. Uh, and I thought, I thought, Bang I thought Bangkok was just extraordinary. I mean, beware of all these bicyclists, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, that is all. And like you can do. everybody, when I've been there before, everybody's trying to kind of rip you off. But when you realise it's only for 20p or whatever, but uh, well done, you've really, yeah. you've got to have I'm your sure wits. I'm sure you'll be you. clinging on to your 20p. Yeah? <laughs> I will be. I will be. I'm um, good to see you. I just, this made me laugh. If I may start, I just want to round up some of the big showbiz stories. We've been talking all day on talk about the M25 closure. Which is now we? traffic free, isn't it? My wife was going to the airport today and she was told to go an hour and a half early and she's yes. been at the airport for ages really yes. so it's okay well they yeah. did really warn you but look at this if you are tom cruise oh my God. and you're filming mission impossible he's got the helicopter he's got a helicopter and he's um, airlifting the crew apparently mission impossible is taking place they're filming it just on, outside on, junction 10 that where so, they're doing all these roadworks yes so they've kind of superimposed it in the sun of him hanging out of a helicopter above the roadworks but so he's he's getting the crew he's flying the crew from battersea uh, the helipad there to i think it's langley somewhere like that uh, which is where they're doing this is the eighth edition of mission, mission impossible yeah. it was delayed last year because of the uh, hollywood strikes right. so he's determined to get things back on track i think it's this... brilliant they do it here now listen i've got yeah. to tell you this very exciting on my way to talk radio now it might have been at our old studios i'm losing track of time yeah but there's a uh, there's one london station and in the film he jumped um <laughs> uh down f what was i don't think it was meant to be a station down from a, a window onto this uh, overhanging roof that you have across the station as it reaches out across Blackfriars Bridge. Blackfriars. And he was running and doing that. I, I watched the whole thing. Wow. I was like, oh, you know, what's going on here? And, and you saw him do it? I saw him do it. Because he does all the stunts, doesn't yes, he? So he does, he does. Any, any bits of run. He does all that, the he's, car crashes, He's going to hurt when he's older. He's, he's going to hurt. His knees are going to go, aren't they? Everything. Eight, eight hip replacements, he'll, the lot. Exactly. You know. Imagine you can probably afford it. He probably can. He probably can. <laughs> uh, this is shocking. I uh, everyone, I can just picture everyone going, what? From our parish, of course, Sharon Osbourne has been on Celebrity Big Brother. And we always like to kind of drill into how much these people are being paid. Ooh. They've worked out today, this is eye-watering, Nick, OK? Um, it works out that she's been paid £6,767 per minute how of much? her say. six hundred and Sorry, £6,767 per minute minute right now listen all the rage i'm getting on mp's pay can you now please think about the six thousand six hundred pounds sharon osborne is getting per minute so she's got so, so, <laughs> so to put into context she's got like a hundred thousand four and they've worked this out for two hours 13 she minutes been off then, she's so she only went in for nine days that was the original agreement but people were people were very excited to begin with because they thought oh, i'd be interesting to see how she is you know with some of the younger celebrities and stuff but they put her and louis walsh in another room so they were kind of kept of away together, just chatting it's it That's hasn't le it hasn't set the fire on. What on no. earth was that all about? It's like yeah. putting you and me in a studio for twenty minutes to talk about films that I know nothing about. With all the other presenters outside, and you know, yeah, absolutely, quite interesting, yeah, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. As have they a good should be with yes. my left wing team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. I think the most uh, Katie Hopkins yes. was the most paid. Big Brother star Good ever, Lord. celebrity Big Brother. Do people she remember Katie Hopkins. She's though? still, I tell you what, like her or low there, she's still knocking around on her social media posts, making her own videos. She got now. slung out of so many things everywhere, didn't she? everywhere. <laughs> but she was paid four hundred thousand for, um, you know, basically a month's work. Uh, so it's interesting, isn't it? The, the whole Big Brother thing is kind of OK. I think it's not what it was. I never liked it, really. I mean, for me, George Galloway and what was her name? Runa um, Lenska. Runa Lenska and him being a cat. The cats. <laughs> and unfortunately, his election meant many dreadful things, in my opinion, but actually it also meant they replayed that scene. Of again, and again, again, and again and again. Again and again and again. And little moments, you know, we got John McCrerick and Jackie Stallone. They really did work on getting those big names, but now they, they're so careful yeah, yeah, about yeah. getting different demographics and younger people, many younger people, rather than the older people. Blah 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 blah. Should we talk about um, some some channel some Channel Five stuff tell going me, on tonight? Tell me what's going. So on. this, you were chatting about this a couple of weeks ago. This uh, Wonka scandal. Do you remember this? Um, it, it's the I'm Wonka. To remember it. 
Well, this program oh, today, Willy Wonka. Willy Wonka, the experience in yeah. Glasgow that they they kind of basically AI'd up. So everyone thought everyone was expecting this amazing, oh, incredible, gosh, yes, and it was immersive experience. Yeah. And you get there, and there's one glum-looking Oompa Loompa, and there was um, oh, he's basically a rented warehouse Our with Oompa a trampoline Loompa's in it. Normally, here. Well, I don't know. I'm quite impressed. They got the one Oompa Loompa, and it wasn't Hugh Grant. Um, but yes, so tonight they're doing a documentary about. I find this interesting, and I think this might be the start of things to come, where people use AI generated images yep. and adverts it's and a, stuff because it looks glossy, it looks great, and you turn up, it's, it's not quite what you. I mean, 35 quid a ticket. Yeah, yeah. You're taking a family, that's over 100 quid, isn't and, it? And is it still going after your. No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I think it lasted for a weekend, but they've got all the interviews, including the people who work there, the disappointed families and their kids going, what is it? I mean, literally, it was a rotting old trampoline in the corner and um, a few bits of chocolate and, as I say, an umpa Did you go out and see this to know I, it was a rotting a rotting mattress in the corner? I'm just trusting all oh, the see, reviews. Oh. I've been on TripAdvisor, Nick. Yeah, yeah. You know. OK, well, it's just that you seem to go to all these glamorous things. I didn't <laughs> notice you going up to watch some dodgy mattress and an umpa lumpa who's got depression. If you sent me, I would have gone <laughs> in Tom Cruise's helicopter. Um, another one, St Patrick's Day. Are you a big yes. St Patrick's? Do you celebrate no. it? It's interesting. Is there a reason I should? Is it just an excuse to go out and drink lots of Guinness? Well, I do like Guinness. I can only drink Guinness with, if it's got a, a people are going to judge me all over the place now, it's got to have a shot of black currant in it to take the edge off. My God, who puts black currant? It's really in? nice. Is it, oh, what do it they makes call it, it a whole is new... It, has it got a name? I just say, can I have a sh shot of black currant in it? And they always go, <laughs> Who is this guy? Anyway, tonight, St. Patrick's Day, BBC Two, great night. That's, that's 20... I'm still struggling on, on this Guinness shot. <laughs> that is like um, having Sacrilegious. A, a Baileys and putting lemon in it. It's just like, exactly, weird, exactly. It? It's weird. Yeah, they're all pulling their face, yes. Yeah, it's just really odd. I have no <laughs> idea how it started or who introduced me, but every time I go there, I'm, I'm going to be... Flung I'm, out I'm going to get loads of messages now. People saying it's a brilliant drink. <laughs> Tonight on BBC One, uh, BBC Two. Sorry, going back to it, you've got all the brilliant Irish acts from Top of the Pops. Uh, you've also got Sinead O'Connor. It's a celebration of Ireland tonight. So Sinead O'Connor in yeah, Sinead. concert, yeah, yeah, doing, yeah. of course, nothing compares to you. She did it on Top of the Pops. That great video. Do you remember the video when she cried in the middle of that I video? I would like to see the documentary about Shane McGowan, actually. Yes, yeah, so this is very late. Now, this is on at 1, 1am. 1 yeah, this won't is the final it. part. He was an interesting character. He didn't bring a clip of that. Wasn't he? Uh, of Shane McGowan? Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, this documentary is not the most famous one one okay. of him there are better ones this is just kind of going through his life and stuff obviously we lost him didn't we yeah. here's someone who was born on christmas day yeah. who appropriately yes and who sung one of the best christmas if yeah. not the best Fairy christmas songs ever York. it never that. got to number one even in his death it, it was more disgraceful what beat it wasn't it well pet shot boys always oh. on my mind oh yeah it. yeah no that's fair uh, enough. because yeah, it's a great yeah, song yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a really it's great just, song no, no, but no. it's a surprise isn't it can i take you to the theater you can now this is interesting because the reviews are very very lukewarm and you wouldn't expect this this is sheridan smith back on oh, the West End stage. advertised on the underground. Yeah, it's called yes. Opening Night. There are pictures everywhere yeah. of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is getting loads of traction because this is a new tactic within theatre. What they do halfway through this play, she plays this drunk woman and she leaves the theatre and goes outside where everybody else is, all the punters are, it's London, Soho, and collapses on the street. Mm. And people rush over. And it's different every up. night. Yeah, but she does it every night, and hundreds of people have started, oh, turning, so up started turning up outside now. the theatre. However, those people in the theatre are apparently not enjoying it, with whole rows leaving Cause, before half-time. Because half they feel time. they're no longer part of it. Well, no, I think it, that's a brilliant moment. I think the problem is... Uh, the script isn't strong enough. Mm. And this is a big return to the theatre. She hasn't been uh, treading the balls for about, I think since about no, 2017. I, like her. I, mean, just, I really she, like her. She, 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 I've always enjoyed what she... she Have you got a favourite moment from Scylla, her? Scylla, I think it was the Scylla Me story, too. which I thought was great. Yeah. Um, you see, I had an answer there. Yeah. Listen, I'm going to ask you a favour. Cool. 
because as you know we have people from all over the country listening to us next time you're on when you're back from your lush holiday <laughs> we need to find out what the manchester scene is or what's going on in edinburgh with theater as well I yes think. it'd of be course. a nice idea to do that yeah of course I just thought of that. always love to um and yes i'm not I'd... trying to stop you carry on i yeah. know you've still got more something um, about ibiza or something. i would like to just quickly tell you about a guest coming in on my show next week oh yes virgin, yeah. virgin 80s, 80s. now is that for only 80 year olds 80 plus yeah you'll be fine nick we give you a, a laminated membership to be listening to it um so we've got um we've got danny rampling now danny rampling is a really interesting character um Matt, he, danny rampling is basically to thank for any nightclub that you've been to I say been post to many, funny 1988 just have a little i've got a little clip of Go you on, talking about quickly. what Let's it's like this. being a dj back then back then uh was it difficult getting hold of these brand new records or, or did you have contacts? Did people send them to you? In my early days, I'd go and spend all of my money on records in London record shops and um, that's my passion. And um, as my radio career progressed and my DJ career, of course, you get given lots of promos. Um, and I still buy lot, all of my music today. I was going to ask you, do you? I value the music that I buy. Um, it's ownership of music. Streaming's great and everything, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in at the, at the helm of DJing and music. Yeah. And, and that's who, who I am. And I think many of my contemporaries are of that mindset as well. You know, when you when you mention someone's name, I'm hopeless. When yes. I see their face, I can kind of work it out. Well, here's a man. It's fascinating. He went to Ibiza in '87 before you know before clubbers used to go to Ibiza, and he went with a guy called Paul Oakenfold and went over there and thought, oh my gosh, this is like an undiscovered world of the most brilliant clubs. And it was thanks to him bringing some of that back here that we got, you know, those big, oh, big okay. nightclubs, the big but superstar DJs, you know, your fat boy Sims, your Norman Cooks, people who, who've made millions from their trade. But it all started with Rampling, and he went on to do massive nationwide dance it's, shows. It's interesting. Dance shows. I told you, the closest I came to a club was in Ibiza where I took my car over to go and visit my brother and his family and yeah. as I was driving out it was like four in the morning or five in the morning there's a really big quite famous club near where the boat docks and my job was to avoid running them over because they were just wandering around in the road doing <laughs> in everything. all kinds of Listen, states <laughs> as ever something for the weekend have a great holiday thank you I'll see miss you, you Nick I'll, I'll miss see you. you as and when that's Steve Denyer of course and his show which is a Virgin Radio Aces Plus my Aces yeah. playlist 4.30pm Monday to Friday all right all right, all right, all right, all there right. There we go. Well practiced. I've done we that before. I thought we were going to get the whole run, uh, list rundown. Coming up, we're going to social care. It's in meltdown. We established that in the first hour. And yet another report warns that it's uh, busier than ever. What I'm learning, I'd like to know, is what are your experiences about that? I'd also like to know how might a change in leadership help the Tories? 0344 499 1000. In this final hour, we will have that and more. And above all, your calls and messages, which I promised to get to. There's so many here. Uh, in fact, I think you smashed a record today for messages. I just haven't been able to get to all of them. And we'll be talking about that police hotline, which I'm slightly suspicious that it will do any good at all. Join me for that all here on Talk TV after the break. This is Talk TV. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge 
Quite right too. Quite right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. you've been for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. That's the ghost of Margaret Thatcher. She said, you've got to watch. That was the woke that was 10 o'clock Saturday night with Lizzie Cundy, Henry Bolton, Pete Barnes, and of course, the woke woman! Thank you for making this such an engaging show. I know a few of you are totally not agreeing with me, in fact, quite a few of you, which is great. I love it. Uh, we can be respectful. One of two of you have managed not to be, but you don't get a look in for that reason. But thank you very much uh, indeed. It's been a great show. And I am happy to clarify Andrew from Salisbury. Can you just clarify something for me? MPs pay isn't tax, so will they take home 91k? In the real world, before tax, that's over 150. Andrew, it is tax. I, I just don't know where you got that from. If it's social media check your sources it's absolute rubbish um, so I hope I can put you right on that and they will pay tax at whatever tax code level they have now I, I want to turn uh, to social care uh, because the report came out um, which is described as a shock report well I don't think it is a shock report this has uh, been a crisis in the building for 20 years at the very least actually but it is about social care and meltdown. That is my experience. I am asking you what your experience is. I've had some really interesting messages and, and uh, after this I'll be going through quite a few of them uh, about your experiences on social care. It obviously has a direct impact also on what goes on in our hospitals because people are not able to get the social care uh, that they need either at home or sometimes if they are moving uh, to paid for care. Uh, I've got to tell you our experiences are frankly leave me just baffled how bad it can be uh, but I also am uh, genuinely um, you know not fake anger here genuinely really um, frustrated that neither political party has grasped the nettle on dealing with social care so uh, to help me navigate that conversation uh, I'm very pleased to welcome councillor um, Koma Schwartz, uh, who is joining me, adult social care spokesman for the Local Government Association, which is the representation of all of local government, and also leader of Islington Council. Nadra Ahmed, um, CBE, who is the co-chair of the National Care Association, which represents thousands of small to medium-sized care homes across the UK. Uh, to you both, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Hello. So perhaps I um, can kick off and, and just ask one of you, because I'm, I'm almost looking through too narrow a lens of my own experience these days. 
but perhaps I could just uh, ask uh, you, Councillor, um, have I got this right, Coma Schwartz? Am I, yeah, I hope I'm you can call me Kaya. Kaya, OK, Kaya, thank you. Um, can you just, if possible, without the, the politics of it at this stage, which I'm happy to get into, but set the scene so people who are not engaged with the difficulties of social care can understand the scale of the problem that we are facing? Um, so the Local Government Association has um, estimated that we need £4 billion put back into adult social care for it to be a functioning system. So that really shows you the extent of the investment needed. The report done by the King's Fund released today, 360, um, really shows the deep extent to which uh, it is impacting our society. We have to remember that adult social care affects adults with learning difficulties, with mental health issues, as well as physical difficulties. So it's really everyone at some point will be touched by adult social care. Um, we have to remember that we have a dedicated workforce who are trying their very best in awful situations to provide care for people. And as she said, Nick, this is in a background of decades of underinvestment. Now, I suppose uh, I should ask you, you the, 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 the scenario you've, you've painted is one thing, but we are also talking about um, social care needed for very elderly people uh, as well, both in their homes and in care homes. That is also, uh, a, that is a huge part of where the social care system is under stress, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And the demand for social care is only growing because of, you know, us living uh, longer, which is a positive thing, but we need a care system that is built to deal with that. OK, um, just turning to you, if I may, Nadra, uh, uh, if, if I may call you Nadra, from a care home uh, perspective, uh, my my experience, both with one that uh, we have a relative who is in, it gives me a little bit of an insight that others may not happen. But can you explain for those listening um, how the care home system works uh, in, in the sense that we have local authority contracts and relationships and then people like us who are effectively paying privately for a complex uh, number of reasons and how much, if you like, capacity and stress is the system under? Well, I, I, I'll join you in that because I've had a, um, a experience with both my parents being in care settings. So it, it uh, navigating is always a huge challenge. But, but let's just focus on where we are. Um, the sector uh, has moved from being a cream tea society um, about 40 years ago when I first started in, in the sector and had a care service um, to and that was that people who were incontinent or had dementia or had um, any uh, sort of clinical uh, diagnosis didn't tend to end up with us. They were in long stage geriatric wards and at that time it was costing the state about £1,000, £1,200, something like that. So we're talking about 40 years ago. Sorry, £1,000, what, what, a week, something a like week, that? Yeah, a okay. week, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, that was the NHS in the long-stay um, geriatric boards. What we, what we have now is that we've uh, moved forward in, in a way that the social care sector, and that's, you know, the, the, the clue is in, in, in the title, um, social care sector is actually delivering uh, quite complex health care conditions because those wards have been closed. So we're in a situation now where we're taking people very often coming straight out of hospital in a discharge scenario coming in and they have some clinical needs some complex needs so the sector itself has moved huge amounts we you know the people that we probably looked after are now uh, being looked after in their own homes and so there's a huge shift of social care what hasn't followed is of course the funding um, and the funding is key part of it, and I won't focus on that. But the, but the other thing that's really important is that our workforce have to be really, really professional, because as we're dealing with dementia, end of life care, somebody with a stroke, um, uh, recovering stroke, anything like that, Parkinson's, we have to make sure our staff are upskilled, trained enough to be able to deal with that kind of condition and ensure that somebody remains as independent as okay. they can and as safe as they can. What a what a lot of people, uh, and I'll just stick with you for this question before before I go go back to Kaya. Um, 
what a lot of people may find hard to understand is that on the one hand, uh, people who are paying privately to go into ho uh, care homes can be paying anywhere between 1,500 and 2,500 pounds a week um, uh, for care. And yet we know that actually some of the lowest paid people are care workers in care, uh, home, uh, care homes themselves. What are the economics of it? Because I actually have someone I know rather well who's abandoned care homes as their business and is now going into um, uh, a, a, a another line of, of, of social care, uh, not in the, the care home as most of us would know it. What are the economics and what is forcing people to reduce, in some cases, the number of care homes that are out there? Well, I think, so if you think about 18,000 um, uh, care settings, um, everybody will have a different business case. And so it will depend very much on, on their borrowings and, um, and on the contracts that they have. So from a local authority perspective, yeah. and I represent small to medium sized providers from a local authority perspective, they might be tendering and are commissioned at somewhere around the 600 to 700 pounds a week. That's what they'd be commissioned to do. So do you end what up with a private they're... subsidizing effectively? You have to make well, the books well, balance you... by charging more. Well, I think I think uh, the, the important thing in that that is that the true cost of care could be anywhere around between 12 and 1500 um, a week. So what then happens is the, the private uh, uh, residents mm. will be charged the true cost of yes, care. Yes. And, and the, the subsidy comes from the provider agreeing to take local authority funded clients. Local authorities are paying something like four pounds an hour for the care. So then you, the, the, the really pertinent and the really important question is about our workforce. So if you are a service that is um, uh, predominantly commissioned by local authorities, that can, it can be 50-50. Some homes in our membership are saying they still have 60-40 splits or 70-30 splits. What that does is that you've then got to think about all the other things that we've got to do. So the training of staff, actually recruitment is a huge problem and you'll know that. Okay. And, and in, you know, bringing in um, international recruits is not a cheap option. For goodness sake, we'd much rather have our domestic okay. uh, clients. So I think I think that the, 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 the pay scenario, most people will tell you they might take somebody at the national living wage but actually as soon as you've got them trained up why would they stay unless you put that up okay recognize kaya perhaps uh, thank you for that let's uh, uh, walk us through some of the economics behind it kaya perhaps i could um ask you uh, I, I i think we have common ground in the belief that myself as a former politician absolutely failed on this uh, governments for uh, quite a while have failed on this um what, what's your ask of government? Is it to effectively start from a blank sheet of paper or is it just simply joining a long queue of people who are asking for more money? No, I think it's it's definitely more money. I mean, what Nadra says is true, but the, you know, the local government are commissioning from central government funding as well as council tax, which is set by central government as well. So we definitely need more funding. We can't get away from that. But I do think it's a better system as well. Um, we've asked for a n number of years now for a national care system. Several governments have said they're looking at it. And I really hope that uh, at the next election, we have a government that but will finally are, are, are you Are you frustrated like me? And I don't want to draw you into the politics of this. I think it's too too important. In fact, I wrote an article talking about how to take the politics out of it. But are you frustrated um, that no uh, n the leading two parties, Conservative and Labour parties, are actually not making this something of debate, that there are no concrete proposals out there? We've had the oven-ready proposals that never materialised. We had the Dill Not report going back goodness knows how long, 21 other commissions. I mean, what is it about this that means our political leaders are failing, you, the local authorities, the residents and the care homes? Yes, I'm, I have to say we are frustrated and it's something the local government association has lobbied on both publicly and privately because, as you said, Nick, it affects all of parts of our system. It affects the NHS, it affects residents, it affects the ability for people who are unpaid carers to get back into 
into the economy so it's actually bad for the economy so we're definitely frustrated we've raised it several times um i don't know why they can't prioritize such an important issue they brought several papers several legislations around it that have never brought about what is needed in terms of I'll, I'll, shall i give you my theory it's because um both conservatives of labor have trashed each other's ideas with silly slogans like dementia tax and uh, death tax. So they're both as bad as each other and they're frightened of dealing with this issue. But that's my theory. Perhaps I could um, just turn, uh, if I may, briefly to Nadra. Nadra, how under-resourced the number of care workers, how under-resourced are we nationally uh, with, with, to, to allow people to be fully staffed? Well, we, we need 152,000. We've got 152,000 vacancies at this moment in time out of a workforce of about 1.6 million. So, so that's we that's about nearly getting on for eight, ten percent. That's right, and and so we 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 had that route of trying to bring in international recruits to do that. But the important thing is that within the next sort of ten years, we need another half a million. Okay. Um, so if we don't get this sorted, if we don't you know, value our workforce, make sure that the person is at the centre of everything we do who needs care and support. Two million people who's, who's, who are waiting assessments, that's a travesty. They, they need social care. We can't uh, give uh, it to them. Uh, actually, I'm going to pick up on this, and perhaps, Kaya, it's, uh, it's not one that's aimed at you, but you might be in a position to, to answer this. In my own experience... Uh, it took us ages to get a memory clinic appointment for someone. And would you say this is normal, that actually a year later, after that um, assessment was made, we still don't have a report? I mean, sadly, we have had to hear time and time again about waiting lists, about assessment blocks, about, you know, um, blocking in terms of getting people out of hospital. These are all things that we all hear in our communities. And this is why it's such such an important issue that needs tackling. OK, listen, to you both, I hope we'll be talking about this again. I'm not going to let it go, and I suspect neither will you too. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Kaya Coma schwartz from uh, Adult Social Care Spokesman for the Local Government Association and leader of Islington Council, and Nadra Ahmed, CBE, who's co-chair of the National Care Association. What's your experience? 0344 499 And Christine has done just that in Manchester. Hello, Christine. Hello. Hi. Um, nice to hear from you. Well, very good to have you on. What would you like to talk about? Well, actually, um, I want to tell you about this. I am 73 and um, I'm having to sort things out because I own my own house. Uh -huh. And I found out that the council, if you needed care, can freeze your bank account, um, can uh, freeze your assets, and, you know, um, just decide on how much they're going to charge you um, if you need care. Okay. And the thing is, I feel that the government and all the government poo-poo them having discussions about this because they don't want to put their hand in the pocket and sort it out because it's going to be too much finance. You see, the, the, there's so many things and in that. The other oh, thing what annoys me is that people who have never, worked, never owned their own house yes, are having yeah. everything free and us that have, have, have paid, worked hard all our lives and paid a mortgage... Uh, uh, could end up that they will charge you as much as they can so that they get all the, the the amount that your house is valued at. And I think it's an absolute disgrace. Christine, I think you've articulated what many people feel, and I'm going to comment on one or two things because I really think that because the, the experiences can be very different from one local authority to another. First of all, your experience about freezing bank accounts, I've not come across. What I have come across is uh, councils, and I think Hertfordshire, where I live, is one of them, is where that, if necessary, they will take, if you like, the first charge on your property to recover mm. the money, which is effectively, uh, mm. you know, giving mm. the ownership of the house in, in many ways mm. over... Uh, but yeah. and until you've run your savings down to a paltry amount, having done the, the right thing all your life, which, of course, many people have done, and you will pick up the bill for that. That is absolutely right. I think it is wrong. Had we designed social care 
at the same time as the NHS, we would not have the system we have now. Absolutely convinced. You made some cracking points there. If anyone else has experienced the same as Christine's, uh, please share with me. Christine, thank you so much for kicking that conversation off. Very much appreciated. Um, I can see one or two others are calling on this and I've got some messages to go through. That's exactly what we're going to do. Although I'm going to also be talking about police hotlines coming up very shortly. 0344 499 1000 to be part of this great conversation. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Hi, Nick. It makes no difference how much Sharon Osbourne is paid on Big Brother, as taxpayers aren't having to pay her as Big Brother is on a commercial station. It would be a different matter if the BBC were paying her. Then I would certainly be complaining about my TV licence. John, you're absolutely right to point that out. And I was a bit tongue-in-cheek when I was saying stop complaining about MPs if Sharon Osbourne is earning 6600 Maybe we should sponsor MPs, you know, get the private sector to pay for them. Oh, no, that probably would break lobbying rules. Might ease the burden for the taxpayer, though, hey? Um, let's, uh, let's, before we go to my next subject about police hotlines, let's take a call from Phil in London. Hello, Phil. You'd like to talk about the care system? Yeah. Yeah, how are you doing today? Very well, uh, thank you. I've been, um, in the last few years, I've had some relatively complex health care problems. Um, I live on my own. My wife passed away. And so I've had quite a bit of experience with the health care system. And... Um, I, what I've found with it is um, I agree with the lady that called before. You do end up getting bills that you're not expecting to get from the local council. But also, 
Is that to do with the care system? Uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Also, what I found was the most frustrating thing for me was uh, people were showing up at my house that didn't even know how to use a toaster. What? Hardly speaking any English. And by the time they left, I was so frustrated that it was just, it was sickening. I mean, the last time I had been in a coma for a while and then I was paralyzed. I'm, I'm a lot better now. But, you know, they were sending people around to my house that couldn't do anything. And if you asked them to do something unusual, like vacuum a little piece of the floor, they would say, oh, no, that's domestic you get one hour. You see, a Phil, that's Very really interesting. That's really interesting because my, my experience. Sorry to cut you off there. I just want to explore a quick yeah. point with you. But that's really interesting because my experience is with care homes. It's not actually with people coming round to people's homes. What you are oh, saying sorry, sounds yeah. no, no. It sounds like to me is part of this problem of paying very low wages, and we were hearing that in reality some of these people are earning effectively seven, eight pounds an hour because they don't get paid to travel, and as a result. You're getting people who are not trained or not skilled enough to deal with the job. Yeah. Well, also what I noticed, and, um, you know, it seems like a lot of foreign entities own these companies, and it seems like they're bringing a lot of their own citizens over too, and they are paying them very low wages. Yeah. The well, it's, it's entirely possible that's happening. I'm not saying it isn't, but the main problem with that is, as you heard... I think she said there's something like 150,000 vacancies. And obviously they can't recruit yeah. on the wages they're paying uh, local people. So they, I suppose they've got well, to get them from somewhere. See, I mean, I know the government have stopped care workers bringing family over now, but we clearly need the care workers. Here's my experience with that. Now, this is for three years. And I've been on life support a few times. I mean, I was very ill. Well, like I said, I'm much better now. But in, in my three years of needing people to come around and help me, I think I've only ever had two English people come in. So, obviously... And you're in, you're uh, in London, are you? In London. In London, obviously. Maybe in other parts of the country. Yeah, I, I expect it is. Yeah, I mean, in, that's a very rational London, point to make. It's... Uh, and, you know, I've en I ended up, uh, the oh. last time, because I was very ill, I ended up, um, I was real, you know, here's one example of how they failed. I was real proud of myself. I'd been in a coma and I'd been very ill, got home finally. These carers were coming three times a day for one hour. And um, as I got a little stronger... I started getting up in the morning and making some toast yep. and some tea yep. before they'd get here. Well, the minute I started doing that, I got a call from their management saying, I can well, imagine. you're much better now, so yeah. we'll, we'll... Well, that is a, we'll a management fault. Once a day. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, I would say... I'm Do sorry to hear that, Phil. Do you how hard it is for me to get up and make I, a slice of toast? I just know? knew you were going to say that, and I am sorry to hear that, and, and thank no, you for your... okay. I mean, Phil, I'm over it now, but... We really need to do something because it, we do. Uh, as much money as they're spending, they're not getting any. They're not getting any service. And, the, and that's the problem. I, I do think. And Phil, thank you for that. I do think that what we pay is a big problem. And I think if you're getting people around who don't speak English, that is a problem, you know? Now, before I get called all sorts of things for that, that, that is clearly a problem. They may have the very best of intentions, I expect they do, uh, although Phil had some examples where he felt that wasn't the case. But it, it, you must be able to communicate with the person you're looking after. So at the heart of this, I'm afraid, one of those few occasions where I say I think money will have something to do with it. Uh, keep your calls coming. Your experiences are what matter, and it's helping inform this position. 03444991000. I want to touch briefly now about something that I've got really mixed feelings because it sounds like a good idea. The idea uh, that a corrupt police officer hotline is rolled out nationally. Now, they've had one of these in the Met Police in London, and the idea is that uh, we have a hotline to call in the event of what is regarded as police corruption. I'm kind of not sure whether this is just something that's going to make everyone feel a lot better, but in practice could cause quite a lot of problems and won't necessarily solve the root problem that there are a lot of officers, according to the Met Police officer, who are unfit for purpose. So let's 
let's n navigate that one. Um, I'm very pleased to say Shabnam Chowdhury is joining me, former detective superintendent at the Metropolitan Police. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, Good afternoon, Nick. This hotline, I was completely unaware that the Met Police had a hotline. Apparently it's ha launched 752 investigations on the back of it or, or close to uh, 728. What we don't hear about is does that mean we've lost 728 police officers whilst they are investigated or were there 728 corrupt, utterly um, unsuitable police officers or not? I've got mixed feelings about this hotline. Can you convince me one way or the other? Well, I don't think it's something that can convince anybody because this is very much a very small chunk of the bigger problem. Um, but what would happen? I think they've had something like 3,000 calls to that particular hotline, um, which is an independent hotline run by Crime Stoppers. And as a result of that, something like 700 officers or 700, when the numbers you've just given have been, uh, are subject to investigation. Some of those officers will be restricted some of those, which means that they'll be given desk jobs, which means it reduces the capability and the resources on the front line. Some of those officers will be suspended and some of those officers will remain in post doing whatever job it is that they are doing until that investigation is concluded, in which case some will be either be charged, will sit on a misconduct panel, be sacked, or those that think that they are going to be found guilty will jump ship and that they will resign but they may still be subjected to that misconduct meeting in any case um god sorry so no well first of all let's look at it from one angle if i just ring up because a police officer has annoyed me or gave me a parking ticket or or, or i felt unjust how are they going to weed out vexatious claims well, they will get vexatious claims, um, just as they do when they had the internal right line in the Metropolitan Police, for example, where there were vexatious complaints made, particularly against uh, the vast majority that came in, where a third of them were against black and minority officers. And then they were investigated and they were either put to bed, nipped in the bud, or some of those were subjected to investigation. They will get ve vexatious complaints because there will be public members, you know, people in the public that are not happy with the way that they've been treated. But this is about victims and um, complainants who are reporting corrupt police officers who are domestic abusers, who are potentially paedophiles, who are um, committing fraud, who are committing all sorts of crimes. And you've seen in the last year in particular, the Met Police have given out a rollout of a significant number of officers who have either been charged, convicted, or uh, subject to going through the judicial process because not necessarily of this right line. The thing that then we need to understand is those 700 and so many officers, what are the actual outcomes? Mm. Have they Will we know? Will we ever know? Well, I think it would be very helpful if the Met, as they are doing this a rollout, they need to say, well, of those 720, we've already sacked this many, and these are still this many are still subject to investigation. They haven't really given you a deep dive into that actual process and how it's worked and how successful it's been. But I would say this. I do think it's a good move, um, but it's not the most important move because there are lots of other issues that need to be addressed within policing in order for trust and confidence to be Well, on, on that note, um, and uh, I, I'm slightly more sceptical about the hotline, but on that note, what do you think are the important moves that have to be taken to, to if you like, deal with this level of um, it, utterly inadequate police members serving in the police force? Well, the biggest issue they've got within policing is actually changing the culture. And that means, and I'm not talking about the culture as in just around uh, some of the diversity issues or some of the race misogynistic issues. This is about police officers who have had the courage to actually speak out, to nip it in the bud. So when there are officers that are behaving in a way that is unacceptable, unprofessional, um, then those officers can be challenged and those red flags can be identified at an earlier stage and they'll either be investigated, issues can be dealt with and addressed very quickly, or they can go and be sacked or um, subject to discipline, whichever it is. And the problem that policing has had, there's been such a culture within policing that certain behaviours have become the norm. Let's not forget why this has actually been initiated. And this is because of the murder of Sarah Everard 
and then after that mm -hmm. followed David Carrick, who was convicted of a significant number of rapes, uh, 49 offences, as I recall. And these are the officers that just walked around and walked around in policing, displaying certain behaviours that just went unchallenged and, and actually were fouled by the leadership because they didn't actually deal with them. And, and would you say, final question on this, would you say it is actually... How wide, let me ask you, how widespread uh, do you think this this um, this culture is and ha how widespread does it affect the police force? Well, it's widespread across every single 43 forces that we've got across the UK. Just look at Nottinghamshire Con Constabulary who have just been put into special measures. Look at the murders of um, uh, Barnaby Webber and Grace Malley, O'Malley Kumar. The families are now asking for a review because of the way the police investigated those matters. So a lot of police forces have got a lot of catching up to do and they need to actually own up to the issues that they've got within policing. And until they deal with the culture internally, they're not going to get it right externally. Uh, Shabnam Chowdhury, you make a very passionate uh, and articulate case why this may be a good idea and just one of a number of moves that are needed to clean up our police forces. Shabnam Chowdhury, former detective superintendent of the Metropolitan Police. Before I go to the break, I wanted to make time because I've got quite a lot of, um, uh, and, and more of your calls then, I've got quite a lot of messages in and I'd really uh, be keen to get through some of these. Uh, social care should come under NHS and be part of the system. We are seeing more care homes ceasing trading, correct, as care homes and residents being forced out. We can find 15 million a day for hotels. I think you're talking about asylum seekers there. Why can't we have our elderly in places like that with NHS registered HCAs and earning a proper wage? If we looked after our elderly as well as we look after others, we would begin being a better society. Um, I really can't find too much to disagree with in that. It's, uh, I think there's other um, comparisons to make about where we spend money, uh, but you make the point rather well there. David, from Chipping Candom. I'm reading these blind, so if I, I'm going to have to self-edit if any of you are taking full advantage of this. Penny as PM. Penny Morden, I've been asking you, is Penny the answer? Penny for your thoughts. Uh, have the Tory MPs lost the plot? The fourth PM in a term. One properly elected, one elected by the party but not the people, one losing the party election but placed in as PM. And now a fourth, neither elected by the people or the party. The Conservatives have wrecked the economy and now seeking to wreck democracy. No name with that, I'm a... Oh, no, I did read it out, sorry. Vicky, I emailed Graham Brady several times before Boris was deposed, telling him Tories would lose the general election if they continued. Obviously, Brady knew better as he didn't take heed. This country waited a long time for a PM like Boris, and we all know a Westminster cop out, uh, a Westminster coup, took him out halfway through our democratic vote for him. The press hounded him relentlessly, and I, for one, will never forgive or trust the press or the Tories again. Sunak had to be seek, sneak through without a vote. Well, he wasn't the only Tory leader, I think, on that basis. And they knew the people would never put him in as PM, as he was disloyal and backstabbed Boris. And on it goes. Let's go to Wayne in Epsom. Hello, Wayne. Hello, there. Hi, you'd like to talk about the care system? Yeah, my dad was in uh, a home for a few years before he died. And he had Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and double incontinent. Mm. And he didn't want to be here. And the homes he was in were run to a price. And like I've heard before, they didn't speak very good English, so he couldn't make himself understood. But we're taking these people from other countries to run our health service. What about their countries? How well, do they get help? Uh, you're talking about care home in this case, yeah? I'm, I'm talking about care home. Yeah. I'm also talking yeah. about thousands of Filipino nurses. But if, if they're over. good nurses... Yeah. and speak English, does it matter? Yes, it does to the Philippines because they haven't got any nurses left. Well, that, that's true. There's that, that sort of you're taking from uh, less well-off economies, uh, yes, nurses exactly. and doctors from other people. Uh, but we do still face up to the brutal reality. We've got three million people who won't work because they have a sickness of sort and it's basically not hard to get benefit support on a number no, of these I sicknesses. I disagree with you with that, I'm afraid. No, I'm no, I haven't said anything. I'm just saying we do have, and, and therefore yes. these people are not working. We've got one and a half million who are unemployed mm. who are not filling these jobs. That's nearly five yep. million people, and they don't want to work, or some can't work. What do we do? We have to go abroad, don't we? 
Well, no. The, the, on, the people in this country, we got assisted dying. Well, to be quite honest, half the people in old folks' home don't want to be here and they'd rather take a trip to Dignitas. And that gets rid of half the problem. Well, we talked so, about that last week, by the way. Uh, we talked yeah, about but, that choice. But we're not making decisions with any thought. We stopped smoking, so all those people are now 30 years into retirement. Well, just put the price down on cigarettes. People will die, and then they won't get to that age yeah. like they used to 40 years so ago. So that's state-sponsored euthanasia you're arguing <laughs> for there, Wayne. No, not really. <laughs> but, I mean, people are saying that we need people... A bigger generation. I mean, if the birth rate keeps continuing... To drop as it is? Well, no, if it increases, then people will get old. Who's going to look after them? Oh, Well, well, well no, I think, I think it's slightly different, Wayne. Unless I've got my, I misunderstand you. We've got more and more old people, like myself, who are going to need care at any point soon. But we've got less younger people coming through to pay for it and fund it. That's the problem. That's... Well, no, because they all come across on boats and say, oh, I work in the health service, is a job. Well, if, 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 as I say, at the moment, if they're good and they can communicate properly, we've mm. got no choice. I mean, I look, I, they've already stopped families coming over with care workers. Now, I understand why the government have done that, and I actually support yeah. the move, but it could make it harder even to get care workers because no one here wants to do it. No one else wants to do it. I Listen. mean, we should we rely on the older generations to actually do something instead of putting them out the grass as soon as they get to 67. Well, uh, I, I think people are starting to work longer. I think when you, when you get... Remember, a lot of people will get dementia and things like that, but you're quite right. Yeah. We shouldn't be putting the older generation out to grass. We are some of the best people to employ to work. I won't include you in that, Wayne, because you sound 21 to me. Wayne, thank you for that. I've got, to, I've got to move on because we're coming up to the break. After that, your calls, your messages. Top of the hour, of course, it's Trish Goddard. 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Interestingly, I've been asked by Sarah on Twitter to record the fact that Boris Johnson did actually publish a, a, a health and um, a social care plan. I have to say, I, I do think it was uh, inadequate because it hadn't been thought through. But in fairness, it was quite late uh, when he did it. He did say it was ready for when uh, he would step into number 10 uh, after the election. Uh, he did publish a plan. It was a plan of sorts. Uh, I did think it had quite a few gaps in it when I've just refreshed my memory of it. But it was, in effect, killed off by his successor uh, rather quickly. So uh, I think I've probably done him a little bit of an injustice there. It just shows that maybe um, I'm not thinking entirely straight on this one and always happy to fess up on those issues. I don't think we'll get into the merits of what his plan was because that's kind of pointless now. But actually, at the end of the day, it didn't really present a finite solution because it was very, very much dithering around the subject. And I don't mean that offensively. It didn't grasp the nettle, which is what neither party has done since. And, and I think that's uh, that's very, very disappointing. Your calls on social care, though, 03444 991000. Have you been trying to get an appointment, have someone diagnosed so they can actually get the care they need, for particularly for dementia? Anything like our experience, it's been an absolute joke, a distressing joke at one at that. Are you paying these high fees anywhere between £1,500 and £2,500 privately for people, someone, someone you care about in a care home and know that someone next to you from the public sector, which has been paid for by the local authority, is probably only paying half that, a quarter of that in some cases, a third of that in some cases. Um, and that's because that person didn't have any savings. As one of our callers said, Francis, I think, from Manchester, you've done the right thing, but you actually get penalised and they take your final penny off you uh, to do that. Or is it fair? Is that life that we have to? Uh, pay for the care that we might need. 0344 499 I'm going to read some of your messages, then I'm going to take Patricia in Rochdale. So just bear with me as I get through these. Um, I'm sure there are XP, XMPs awarding the MPs pay rises. I would be very surprised if an MP is actually on the uh, on the panel that sets what uh, MPs pay is, the IPSAR panel. Dear Nick, with all due respect, as an average class person in this country right now, MPs are paid far too much and they're not working for the people. There should be people in power who want the best for the people. There are. Just doesn't always work out like that. And an awful lot, I do agree, get kind of sucked in by the system that looks after them and not you. That does happen. That I'm not denying that. Pay them less, have more normal people. You choose the people. OK, you, the people, choose the people. If you don't like them, don't vote for them. Pay them less, have normal people, not just privately educated career crooks. Oops, I mean politicians. Michelle, there, there's far less privately educated people in the House of Commons than you think of, by the way. Are the, are, are, are the other ones not corrupt? I think if you look at the evidence, you might find it kind of is in the balance. I think it's more about not where they come from about what they are and you have the final say. I know it's not as easy as it sounds, but that is worth bearing in mind. Patricia in Rochdale, Greater Manchester. Uh, Patricia, welcome. You'd like to talk about the care system. Hello. I've just been watching your programme on telly. Great. Which is, I think is very good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm 87 years old. Right. I'm, in, I'm absolutely looked after. I'm in a, a bed. Con uh, my brain's great my body's rotted okay so just i'm sorry to hear that but it gives us context yeah, i'll just babble it all out eh? go on then uh, me and my husband's worked all our lives me in the care system nhs my husband on the railway my husband did a couple of few years ago with alzheimer's 
I carried on and then I got ill like this. So I need constant care. Now, last year, we had over a £1,000 in the bank for our old age, which my husband said, that'll keep us in our, keep us going. But it didn't. Because then I had to get private care. I got private care, and it's three thousand pounds a month, and I've only got two thousand pounds coming in. And out of that two thousand pounds, I have to buy everything: my own bedding, uh, my own towels, my own toiletries, all the stuff that with being poorly like I am, I use loads of it every day. Now, I have the carers four times a day. They come in four times a day, yeah. They come in four times a day, and most of them are very good. But now and again, we have lately, I've been having people that don't know how to care. And, like, they strip me off in the morning. I'm sorry I'm saying this. No, you say, go on. They strip me off in the morning, and I'm bare, absolutely bare, to people I don't know. Oh, and, and and the indignity of that and the worry yeah, about that. And it's, it's going on, but the thing I'm on and why I'm ringing is I'm so worried. What are they going to do with me when that 20,000 goes, 3,000 a month won't last long now, when that goes, uh, what are they going to do with me? They said, well, you'll go on benefits. I don't want to go on benefits. I haven't worked to go on benefits. You know, I, it's getting me all. Patricia, really have you got up. have you got anyone in your? F is there anyone in family you can talk to or a friend? I've got, I've got five sons. They're all in Australia. They, but this, my sons, our granddaddies, they're in their eighties now, and I've one son here, and I've got a daughter who's a paramedic, who's done it for twenty can, odd and, years. And and can can they not? Um, F find you don't really want to know. I don't want to worry them. I know you and don't I want also, to worry them, but they would be horrified that you I are. I know my son knows, but if he's saying, "Well, you have to do, you have to do," no, he's just going to go in. He's retired. Should have retired last mm. year, mm. but it will, they're like my husband. They won't start work, uh, and he's got. He's going in for operation now to have his foot done. And he's, he's really annoyed because he has to start work. And so I don't want to put anything... My, my daughter's on the first response on the... On well, the yeah. Well, I, so I don't ring her. I don't... She's enough to put up with her. I, I appreciate yeah. that, but I think they... My guess is, and this is how I'd be feeling... I'd be pretty cross with you if you didn't tell me what you're worried about because they can find out your circumstances. If you, they are as what you've told me, Patricia, yep. the state won't take all your money. They should not take all your money. But I want you to get some advice and I would have thought your sons or daughters might be a little cross with you if you didn't share with them your concern. And yep. failing that, failing that, why don't you try and get one of your local councillors or even your MP to just give you some advice. They've got people who work in their office who will know how to advise you on this, or at least get you advice. Yes, you're the, you're the only one, actually, that said that. That's what I think. I think that there's that many of us... It, I've heard the girls coming... I call them the girls that help me. Because the girls coming around talking about different people, and the, so many that's come out of the NHS have got a private pension. Yes. So they just pay over that, so then you have to pay for your care. Yeah, you do, I'm afraid. I, and, and, and I don't know the exact circumstances. Look, Patricia, please do follow up on that advice and keep listening because someone may call in in the next few minutes and be able to uh, offer even more advice than I did. Let's talk to Julia in East Yorkshire. Hello, Julia. Hi, Nick, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for calling on this subject. What can I do for you? Yeah, I'm ringing just, I think, there's quite a lot of mist around adult social care. I'm probably going to go a little bit off track, having listened to that lady who's just been on. Yes. In terms of financial assessment, she needs to contact social services, have a new financial assessment. You are correct. The local authority does not take all your money. OK. Anything up to 14000 is disregarded. Julia, I'm that. just going to stop you there. Patricia, I hope you're listening to that because Julia's just... Who, who is it you contact, Julia? Uh, the local authority, social services. Great. OK, your local um, authority in Rochdale. Fine. So thank you for that, Julia. That was very helpful. So she really needs to do that. I mean, I was just ringing generally because I think 
what has happened, social care has been the syndrome. I'm an ex-social worker and an ex-social work manager, so I've done this for 20 years. And I've just seen the local authority budget decimated, really. Uh, and that is the problem, isn't it? It's getting cut it, and cut. It, it is. So they haven't been able to pay the agencies and the care homes. But the amount that these people, to the agencies for them to pay their staff at the correct levels, so they should be paid, care workers in the community or in a residential home should be paid the same as a uh, an NHS. Is healthcare. it something they don't get paid for, they don't get paid for travel time or something, is that right? It can be, it depends on the contract. In the authority mm. I work, people were, but it, it can vary. I mm. think as well the capital limits have never gone up so little. Mm. When I began in practice to be a self-funder, it was anything over about 19,000. It's now tw 20 years later, it's 20... And it hasn't... It's hardly... Exactly. A very, not. very important point. What and I think the Illinois report should have been brought in. We should have been up to 70,000. I, I look, it's a really harsh question because I don't think anyone knows the answer. I certainly don't know the answer. But here we are with this huge problem. It's affecting the NHS even with social Absolutely. care. Absolutely. Uh, but, but apart from that, it's the dignity, how we're treating older people, yep. etc. And the fact that we're raiding so many savings and it seems unfair for some and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 compared to others. I mean, are you like me, just baffled that neither the Conservative Party, my party, if you like, one I was an MP for, and the Labour Party are refusing to engage on this in any level before an election? As, as an organisation, as a social worker, we've been going to every government possible about this for years. It has to be sorted. People shouldn't be living in fear of getting old. And and the, like the lady who was on before, I think... Patricia, taking all the money off them. You know, it's, it is wrong. I think there should be a cap on the amount anyone pays in their lifetime. The, the self-funding threshold should be significantly raised so people aren't, again, aren't having to get rid of all but 14,000 of the savings. I, I thought it was actually a bit higher than that. Not much, but, but that, you're absolutely right. It, it should be raised because... So from 14,000 onwards, they take yeah. one pound for every 250. Yeah. But Gosh, I wish that. you'd come on. I wish I'd interviewed you, Julia. You know more than you know more than other people about this. Listen, thank you, Julia. That was really helpful. I'm going to be covering this again. Please make sure you're the first call when I'm doing it, because I think you know a lot of the technical detail that even I haven't come across, and I've been getting involved in it. Julia, thank you very much okay. indeed for that. Um, and uh, th I'm afraid that's going to be my last call. Uh, I was really pleased, actually, although Patricia's call was very troubling, um, particularly, and I'm glad Julia was able to answer some questions. But thank you for engaging on this subject. It's interesting. We should all be very, very concerned about this because it's going to affect all of us. Us baby boomers particularly, we have the older parents uh, and it's beginning to hit home. Claire Turner says, my heart breaks for Patricia. I left care system as I got more pay at McDonald's, but I would love to be able to help people like Patricia for nothing. How dare they strip her bare is just disgusting, says Claire Turner. You effectively have the last word as far as I'm concerned. Not, not in practice. I do appreciate uh, your impact. It, it is a great show, isn't it, that actually um, you, you take it in a direction that I'm never quite sure where it's going to go. I was saying to this to Peter Cardwell at the beginning when we were handing over, and we discussed some really big issues. And yes, I've heard you on MPs' pay. I still have my view. I'm sure we'll talk about it in the future. But 